Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Like Bruce said, I'm Jennifer Pick, and I'm on behalf of all the rest of our um, team at Connell. Uh, we are so happy you're here, and we're happy that Mother Nature was easy on us um, this time around. So thank you for coming back uh, for our second try, right? So uh, I am also one of those people looking forward to the, the May uh, event, because hopefully we don't have any snow or ice. Um, a couple, I say three things of high, high, um, housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, you'll see in front of you, you have a Connell mug. My goal is that I don't have to take any mugs back to my office. So if you have a, a birthday gift you need to uh, wrap or just some friends back at the office and you see a mug that's just sitting there alone, please take it. No mugs left behind is my motto. And you are welcome to drink out of it. We have, um, I don't know if you saw the hot cocoa, that's little, that's supposed to make everybody happy and think about good things. Um, table tents, the little small table tents in front of you. Uh, there's two sides. One side is actually a QR code for our survey for today. So uh, you can just take another picture. I'm making you get use your phone a lot today, I know. Um, and you can complete your survey on that side. The other side is a link to go ahead and RSVP for our May event, our spring seminar. So you can get that on your calendar and and block off that day. So I will make a note that is back in Branson. So if uh, if you were wondering to know, know about logistics for that, that's in Branson. And the last thing I wanted to show you, uh, or just to mention is the Connell playing card. Uh, we don't have any poker tables set up. So if you were worried about that, um, we, we're gonna have a little fun at our first break. So if you did not get a playing card, uh, make sure you see somebody, uh, one of our Connell folks will help you and we had tons of cards. Um, but you need to take a look at your card and mine is the eight, an eight of hearts. On the break, I'd like us to find all your other pairs. So you don't have to find the whole suit uh, of like the hearts, find all the other number or if you're king or queen. And this is just a little mini um, social. So introduce yourself, maybe exchange a couple of things. Uh, I, I feel like since COVID, we haven't been able to socialize as much. So I'm helping you <laughs> um, socialize. So that's on first break, just make it fun, introduce yourself. And if you do feel like you're at an airport looking for your person, that might, we'll all do it together. Okay, that's all I had to say, thank you. Um, I'm gonna introduce Mark. Um, I'm excited that he made it all the way from New York. Last night we were crossing our fingers and toes that he came through uh, just fine. So a little bit about Mark. Um, Mark Perot is a 32-year-old veteran of the financial services industry. After spending his formative years at Merle Lynch, helping roll out the likes of Callaway Golf, Snapple, and Boston Chicken, Mark moved on to lead creative retirement planning and has been doing so for the last 24 years. During that time, Mark co-hosted the Money Talks radio show. He has earned a certificate in investment decisions and behavioral finance from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Mark has earned a certificate in mergers and acquisitions from DePaul University. He is a veteran speaker of more than 600 presentations, and he was keynote for the AICPA's Conference on Trends. Mark's book, Mega Trends and the Next Economy, spent three years as the highest rated Echometrics book on Amazon. Mark is currently working on his second book, tentatively entitled, When Darwin Goes to B-School. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Mark this morning. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me. You are something like my 700th or so, uh, one of these. And back when I was first presenting outside New York, the first one I had given uh, uh, outside New York was in Chicago for what turned out to be a group that had been together for 37 straight years. And these were all CEOs. Something fascinating was happening. One of the guys in the room just decided to ask me way too many micro-oriented questions, like one after the other, after the other, after the other. After his eighth in a row, I realized this guy could totally hijack the entire presentation. So I timed him out and I said, I want to respectfully decline from answering your question. And you've got to respect the fact that everybody else has to walk away with value here. And uh, I slipped him my cell phone number and I said, how about you and I continue this conversation offline? Is that okay? And he said, yeah. 
And then when uh, they handed in their evaluation sheets to the speaker, uh, these were anonymous evaluation sheets too. This was the only person in the room that didn't rate me at the top score. He rated me like uh, midway, that sort of thing. And how we knew it was him was he wrote on his piece of paper, I gave the speaker three because he didn't answer my question. And the guy sitting next to him wrote, I gave the speaker a five because he didn't answer his question and then drew an arrow across the page. That's how they knew, that's how we knew that they were sitting next to each other. So I'm like, well, what do you do with that as a resource speaker, right? So uh, I, what I figured out was maybe some rules of engagement here to make sure everybody here walks away with value. So the first thing is there's going to be lots of rabbit holes that we can go down, uh, especially when I'm giving you the data heavy portion of the presentation. And my argument is that if it's germane to your business model, definitely speak up. If it's, uh, if it's more of an intellectual curiosity, it might be better like to hold off till the break. Is that fair? All right, the second one is we're all suffering from an electronic version of ADD. That someone's outside this, this room that we're speaking in here today, uh, metaphorically trying to tap you on the shoulder about something that appears to be urgent. So what, what the, the kind of dirty secret of organizations like this is that they are not urgent, they're important. See, my belief the role of an organization like this, Bruce's role in all of this and mine, is to pull your noses off the grindstone just long enough to look over the horizon more accurately. So what you're gonna be learning here is about what's behind what's happening. So I'm not gonna be burying you in economic theory. In fact, I'm gonna be destroying some economic theories, but I am gonna be uh, telling you some things that might actually offend you. So my argument is this, the new superpower, you might wanna write this down, the new superpower of the 21st century is to be unoffendable. If you are unoffendable, then you are open to truth. And frankly, if you're easily offended, you're probably an idiot, non-deserving of the, the seat that you're sitting in in the moment. So what I want you to do is be prepared because I'm going to offend you. So what we need to do is take our political convictions and set them aside. What I'd love is as a result of hearing this presentation is you take your political convictions and throw them out the window. They stand in the way of business leaders. And the reason why is this, this you might want to write down. You abdicated your right when you stepped up to be a business leader to play victim to politics ever again. Think about it this way. If we were to add up how many employees, how many people are represented by the leaders in this room, we'd be in the thousands. Is that easy to say? What if we added in their families? How about your customers? How about your, uh, your, your suppliers, your vendors? Do you see where I'm going with this? So what happens is playing the victim is, isn't in the, your, the best interest of your mission or your message. Because what employees are looking for is steady at the helm. Does playing the victim create steady at the helm? Attaching your mental state of mind to something outside your control, does that create steady at the helm? You see where I'm going with this? We need to throttle back on all this political vitriol. And that's really the basis of my next book. So what I'm going to be teaching you about is something called blue lies and the evolutionary basis about why we are so politically divided. So what that does, that kind of helps shape like why things are happening. What evolution also does is makes our customers ridiculously predictable. Has anyone here read the book, The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb? Anyone? Nobody? Good. It's a waste of time. I'm not a big fan of 500 page books that should be one sentence long, right? So I'm just going to tell you the sentence so you don't have to waste your time reading that book. Although the man who wrote it is uh, a genius. He's beautifully articulate. Uh, genius hedge fund manager, newly minted PhD in theoretical mathematics, really smart guy. That guy should be writing slogans or articles, not books. So the, the basis of that book is all about how to predict black swan events like coronavirus. And the main takeaway from that book is the only thing that's predictable about unpredictable events is that they are unpredictable in both what they will look like and when they will happen. What I'm going to be teaching you is the predictable future. I'm going to increase the accuracy of your forecasting by teaching you just how boring human beings really are. Like suffice to say, and this is not something that the press can be aware of, and the reason why, and that's partially our fault, it's a transaction business model, and they have to sell advertising space. You are five times more likely to die from a vending machine accident than you are a shark attack. Yet there isn't vending machine week on Discovery Channel for a reason. We need to be sourcing our information from better places. Tell me the truth, though, in the back of the room. Can you hear me if I walk around? Good, because I'm a walk-arounder kind of guy. Can you hear me?
Okay, so if I gave you guys the best book I have ever read, and I haven't read this book just once, I've read it now seven times. I've also rewritten this book, Longhand and Pen, five times. The book is called How the Mind Works by Steven Pinker. And I'm going to give you lots of reading material. So what you can do is my contact is on the back of your handout. You can just send me an email and I'll send you the bibliography. So you don't have to write down all these names, some of which are really difficult to spell. And frankly, spelling wasn't exactly my forte. So you don't have to say, how do you spell, you spell that person's name? Like, I don't know. I'm not the right person to ask. Can you hear me okay? No? Okay. All right, so the, uh, I'll come back. And then maybe we can get a, a lapel mic. Perfect. Oh, you got a hand mic? Perfect. All right, so the, the, the best book I've ever read is called How the Mind Works by Steven Pinker. All right, he is my favorite author. He's a 13-time best-selling author, but he's not an easy read. So if I gave you this book as a gift, I want your honest, uh, honest answer here. If I gave you this book as a gift, it's 522 pages long, and there's a word in every paragraph you're not going to know the definition to and kind of need to. Who here is going to be psyched about that gift? All right, well, thank you for your honesty. All right, so on the bibliography, what I do is I walk you through how to source this information from better places. What you want to be doing is putting PhDs on your radar screen. What they are able to do is produce objective truth. If you want subjective truth, you can get that anywhere. It's everywhere. So now before you start writing me emails saying, Mark, how dare you impinge the integrity of the press? Understand that um, freedom of the press is a wholly defensible ideal. What the free press does with that freedom ain't so defensible. You need to be sourcing your information from better places. So what I would start with are podcasts. The best podcast out there is the Michael Shermer podcast. Michael Shermer podcast. The reason why is he's a PhD. He's also a 13 time best-selling author. He's a professor of skepticism out of Chapman University in California. And he, his most famous book is called Why People Believe Weird Things. So he can answer the question why the Flat Earth Society today has more membership than it did in 1957 when the, when the membership was first formed. Thanks, bro. You guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Maybe we got to turn it on. Okay, you got it. I'm testing. One, two, one, two, one, two. Testing. One, two. Got it. You guys can hear me now? Okay. All right. So um, what I would do is I would turn to uh, um, Audible. And you, guys, you guys can listen to a book two and a half times faster than actually read it. Can you hear me back there? Yeah? Okay. All right. So Audible. You can uh, listen to a book two and a half times faster than you can read it. Right? Uh, second thing is you want to you put on your radar screen Blinkist. Uh, Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. It's an app. So it costs a couple of bucks per month, but what it will do is summarize every book that's worthy of reading. And it will give you a 15-minute read in a very short period of time. Then you can see, oh, is this something I want to do a, a deeper dive with? So then you turn to the actual book. And, uh, and I'm not expecting you to do what I do. Uh, I spend a lot of time on airplanes. So by the end of tonight, I will be on, I've been on 14 airplanes in 14 days. So that gives me the ability to do research at a level that most people can't do it because I'm sequestered. You can't get a hold of me. So, uh, so therefore I can do a deep dive in a book and then physically hand write the book, uh, all the important points. I'm not expecting you to do that. But what I am expecting you to do is start exchanging uh, good authors that you can turn to. And I'm gonna be uh, bringing to your attention a host of ones you need to put on your radar screen. And the main reason why is because if you want to understand yourself better, your spouse better, your kids better, your employees better, and most of all, your customers better, you need to understand these authors work. Because what it is is a deep dive in human nature. And human nature gives great explanatory value to the future. If you can take ownership of the knowable future, bake it into your strategic planning, your marketing planning, your investment planning, then all of those plans will become more durable and more sustainable. The catch is it's boring. Like suffice to say, the day you buy a minivan, even your car insurance company knows you don't look good naked anymore. 
Just kind of that's how life goes. All right. So as we pursue what are referred to as Darwinian meta drives or biological imperatives, uh, each of the intervals of our life, each of the economic intervals of our life become highly predictable. So one of the things we need to understand is with our customer base and our strategies, are we taking into account our customer? Are we taking into account our customer's customer if we're B2B? So one of the things I would want you guys to get out of this is certain certifications that are perfect for HR uh, directors. Uh, certain uh, aspects about human nature that you can sit back and take a long, hard look at your strategy right now. Does it look good going forward? Have we baked into our strategy the next recession? It's been 13 years since the last one. That is eons of time, economically speaking. That's like living on the West Coast and you haven't had an earthquake in 25 years. It's time to buy the insurance. So we're going to build the insurance plan. So we're going to start big, understanding how the CIA predicts hotbeds of violence in the world. What that's going to do is actually help us to predict hotbeds of economic growth. So as we come down the funnel of knowledge, I'm going to be describing to you just how boring your customers are. And that, so boring, I plan on boring you guys for like a good 40 minutes, so buckle up. The catch is some of what I have to talk about is gonna be offensive. So we have to be unoffensible, unoffendable. Everyone here in agreement? All right, so um, where, we, where we, we're gonna take a break at that point. When we come back, I'm gonna teach you how you can predict the next recession. And then we have to acknowledge, okay, how can we build an insurance plan against recession? So we're gonna be able to steer our energies of our company, gain alignment around that, about which industries are classically recession resistant. Like Connell Insurance, this is a slam dunk for you guys. Also being able to predict uh, one of the leading indicator businesses and then track those as business and maybe even give their behavior patterns and what is their report on the, the business that they do, you can give that back to your other customer base to increase customer service. Then what we're gonna talk about is some dynamics, some trends in acquisition. Where does this all lead to? How do we move the needle positively on extreme valuation? This is going to pad your resume. And the two certifications you need to put on your radar screen, I'd write this down. The first one is a certification in mergers and acquisitions. So that one is actually offered at DePaul University. More of like an accounting certification. So if you don't have strong accounting skills, like, uh, that, was a, that was a strong head nod there, All right? No, 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 okay, cool, I appreciate the honesty. All right, so then I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress that one. But what I would look, it's more like a, if, you're, if your company is gonna be selling sometime soon, the think tank needs to have this certification on their think tank. So maybe it's who you steer the, the, the CFO towards or the controller towards. The, uh, the HR certification is called a, uh, a certification in mergers integration. That's offered out of Carnegie Mellon or an organization called Pritchard out of Dallas. It's about five grand, it's about a week away from work. But what happens is the majority of all deals are deemed failures because the cultures are not integrated properly. So that will pad your resume, food for thought. So with that, what we're gonna do is not be offendable. And then uh, we can jump right in here. Is anyone here familiar with who Tom Coughlin is? former head coach of the New York Giants. He had a sign in his office wall that said, if, uh, if I hear something, I'll forget it. If I see something, I'll know it. If I do something, I'll remember it. That's when we added a handout to the presentation to encourage you guys to write things down. By the way, the, the, the last and final thing about something that can stand in the way for you to get the most from this presentation is, we're living in a world where students are demanding that professors not be allowed to bring up anything that could potentially offend them. That's a special type of stupid folks, right? That's actually anti-learning. We wanna come from pro-learning perspective and not be easily offended. So, and that's something we need to course correct in universities too, by the way. Okay, so moving on. And economists will tell you that the economy breaks into thirds. One third is the government, two thirds is the population. Now it doesn't take much more than a fourth grade math education to realize that uh, the government, uh, or really two thirds, is more influential than one third. 
So ask yourself, why is the one-third covered at nauseum on Fox News, CNBC, or wherever you're consuming your news entertainment from? My belief is when you take the power out of the hands of the many and move it into the hands of the few, it becomes unpredictable, compelling, dramatic, scary, wonderful fodder to sell your advertising space for more money. Unfortunately, it's, it's of little or no strategic benefit. So what it does, it, it, it'll uh, keep your finger on the pulse of like, let's say what's going on in Ukraine right now, which are really rare one-off events, black swan events. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't help you predict the future more accurately. In fact, if you can produce the future more accurately, then you're not a great audience for them because you'll know where they're off the rails and how they're trying to concentrate your attention on the wrong things. So uh, I would write this down. If the information that you're getting is coming via the television, it is fictionalized. So think about it this way. Now that goes for Fox News or MSNBC, either one. So I'm not a fan of either. And the reason why is I'll even go as far as to say that sporting events are fictionalized. So anyone here an NFL fan? All right, so when your quarterback throws an interception, does it bother you? When they show it to you seven more times in slow motion, does it bother you less? You see where I'm going with this? So what happens is they have to grab our attention. And what grabs our attention are no longer relevant existential threats. Right, so picture, the, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody when I bring this up, but there are a people, an indigenous people of the Arctic, once referred to as Eskimos. Well, they did psychological testing on them. And Eskimos are afraid of snakes and spiders too. Guess what doesn't exist in the Arctic? Do you see where I'm going with this? So what our brain is hardwired to pay attention to lo no longer relevant existential threats. The reason why is because our brain evolved in the Pleistocene. It is a stone age tool that we are attempting to navigate the modern world with. So what does that mean? That means what we have to do is recognize, are we being manipulated and how are we being manipulated? I want you to be so aware of it that you can't be manipulated anymore and that you can know how to manipulate other people with it because you can sell more stuff to more people in your organizations. Sound good so far? Awesome. All right, so let's, let's take a first stab at this. I don't want you to overthink this. Frankly, HR, to, uh, HR directors tend to overthink things, all right? So what we wanna do here is don't overthink it. If you have to ask me a question on these questions, you're overthinking it. I want you to look at these four, uh, four questions here and circle the age group that you think does these the most. So which one of these age groups do you think spends the most? Which one produces the most? Which one uh, earns the most? And which one invests the most? And then give me a high sign when you're finished. Circle it in your handout. You guys ready? It's 50 years old for all the above. So let's call this the first economic takeaway from the presentation is you can tell the health of any economy in the world based on how many 50 year olds they have in it. And you can source that information for free from the CIA. It's called the CIA World Factbook. If you Google it right now, hit images, 193 countries uh, in the world will pop up instantaneously. And I'm gonna teach you how to interpret that data, frankly, because um, the CIA won't return your phone calls. And if you hound them, you end up on some kind of watch list. I don't recommend that. All right, so what, what those age pyramids look like is this. All right, so what that is, uh, now this is the first of the things that I'm gonna be potentially offending you for. So here, here comes the warning, the offense warning. It's this, the CIA breaks down all age pyramids between male and female. And the reason why is because, although this is scientifically accurate, what I'm about to say is sexist, when males are young, we do really stupid things. Anyone wanna disagree with me there? All right, I've got four boys under 24. They all seem to peak in their decision-making at 12 and then started this kind of dark descent that I'm hoping they spring up out of around 26 or so. Well, according to Luann Brenzadine, who is the lead researcher in the world on studying the differences between male and female brains, she actually wrote the book, The Female Brain, completely worthwhile read right now, especially because COVID kind of made us a little bit uh, uh, too close together in our, in our marital relationships and marital vitriol is up as a result. She wrote The Female Brain about 13 years ago. It was so successful, they turned it into a movie. 
That enabled her to publish the male brain. And yes, the male brain is only about 110 pages long. It's like a nice, light, easy read, right? So the, the, so the situation here is this. At eight weeks of gestation, the fetus that will become male is masculinized. It's bombarded with testosterone, which kills off sections of our memory and emotion, significantly inflating the male brain for violence, action, aggression, and a couple other things that are kind of obvious about dudes. Doesn't that explain a lot? All right, so if you're the CIA and you uh, have this knowledge and you're looking to save taxpayer dollars, what should you be concentrating on in order to predict violence in the world? Males, right? So, and is that, is that profiling? Yeah. Is it scientifically accurate? Yeah. So why waste pay that taxpayer dollars? So what we'd want to do is find, if you're the CIA, you're looking for underdeveloped countries with a lot of young males. You're going to get violence, action, aggression, ganglands, uh, and maybe even violent revolution. All right, so let's, let's look at the three basic shapes here. We got Canada, Brazil, and Mexico. Now, one of the things you don't want to mistake is that the past equals the future. The past does not equal the future. However, demographics are one of the things that gives great explanatory value for predicting the future. China is not the next China. You cannot have one person supporting two parents, supporting four grandparents in an economy. The economy implodes. China's got much bigger issues than going to war or uh, giving us headaches. They got real serious economic issues. China's not the next China, and you can't trust statistics coming out of China. The finance minister's name is We Lie. So, like, well, I don't know why you're laughing at. That's actually the guy's real name. All right, so what happens here is we've got Canada, Brazil, and Mexico. These are the three most common shapes. Canada, write the number 129 next to it in your handout. 129 countries out of the 193 echo the same basic age pyramid as Canada. And that's not good for our economies. That's all of Western democracy, including the United States. That means we're old, stodgy, and getting older. So what that means is all of Western democracy is going to have to radically change its attitude towards legal immigration. Now, how's that for a paradigm shift over the conversation about immigration over the last decade or so? Right? But that's the truth. That's what's behind what's happening. So, and can your politician tell you what's behind what's happening? Can your politician tell you this is this is the scientific truth? You are the healthiest, wealthiest, safest human beings ever to walk the earth. Now, is your home security service ever going to call you up and tell you that? What's Ring going to do? Does anyone here have Ring? All right. So what Ring did when you first downloaded the app is notify you of all the crimes that are happening in your local zip code. Why would they do such a thing? Because they care about you so much. That's called sarcasm. I don't know if you guys have enough of that in Missouri, right? So we got it in droves. I'll ship you some extra if you're missing any, All right? So what happens here is why does Ring do it? One, it's free information. It's public information. It is the cheapest, best marketing I've ever heard of. So what are they able to do is ping you on a regular basis until you tell them to stop about all the crimes that are happening in your local zip code, confirming why you bought Ring in the first place. You're sitting at a, a, a cocktail party going like, <laughs> looking at your phone going like, hey, did you see this? You, know, you guys hear about this? Well, how do you know that? Well, I got ring. Well, maybe I need two rings. Maybe I need a ring too. That is genius marketing and completely congruent with evolution, by the way. So what happens is your politician cannot get on a campaign stump and tell you you're the safest, healthiest, wealthiest human being ever to walk the earth. In fact, your politician has to lie to you. They have to tell you the opposite. And the politician you love the most is lying to you the best. The talking head on television that you turn on late at night when you sit down with your drink, trying to shut down from the world, what are you really doing? Are you looking to be informed or are you looking to have your perception of the world confirmed? See where I'm going with that? The talking head needs you to do something tomorrow night. What is it? This, this means audience participation. Watch again. Now, how do they get you to watch again is they got to convince you that you're the, the victim of some impending threat, and therefore they have to lie to you. You're the safest, healthiest, wealthiest human beings ever to walk the earth. You need to be sourcing your information from better places. See, politics are for lesser minds. Massive study of IQ done out of Harvard by a man named David Perkins. 
it turns out moral arrogance is not solved for by higher IQs. A higher IQ does not lead to a better uh, way to find truth. No, you become better at arguing your stupid ideas. So, and the internet is what? It's the sum total of human knowledge at its best. What is it really? It's an idiotic echo chamber. We gotta be really prepared about what the algorithms we're going down. Oh, people like this, like that. Oh, people who are morally arrogant are more, more, uh, more morally arrogant over here. You should pay attention to this. They're trying to grab your eyes and what you need to be doing is breaking that cycle. Putting those authors on your radar screen, uh, the authors I'm gonna mention to you is a good step in that direction. Right, if, uh, frankly, there's only about 10 books a year. You don't have to read all 10,000 new nonfiction books a year. Only 10 are really worthy of reading. So it would be kind of cool is to set up like a, like a book sharing or a, a book club aspect to all of this too. Hey, this book was really good, what do you think? Hey, this book is really good, what do you think? Great source of that is good reads. All right, so back to this. 129 next to Canada, old, stodgy, getting older. Brazil, Brazil is an economic juggernaut. How many people here have an international footprint or are looking to have an international footprint? Nobody? Okay, so this is like more like, how do I diversify my 401k, Mark? How do I diversify my stock portfolio? Well, you don't wanna confuse the past with the future. China's not the next China. Brazil is an economic juggernaut. However, they're a giant pain in the tush to do business with. There's four ingredients to prosperity. The first ingredient is compulsory education. I'd write that down, compulsory education. The second one is female empowerment. Now you guys live in what was once the Wild West. And the mistake we make is we, we convince ourselves it was the John Waynes of the world that tamed the Wild West. Now you know what tamed the Wild West? Women. When the women showed up, the men stopped doing the dopey things they were doing before the women showed up. And then the men wanted them to stick around, right? So for obvious reasons. So the situation is the single best thing that can happen for uh, pacifying the world is female empowerment. And the country that has the strongest amount of female empowerment advancement in the last decade is Iran, believe it or not, right? I was shocked with that one. The single best thing that can happen for geopolitical stability and ending a half a dozen scourges that plague humanity on a regular basis is eliminating extreme poverty. So don't be one of those Americans that's pissed off about us giving money to other countries. It's a great, uh, it's a great investment in pacification. So let me explain it to you because the press will not. And the reason why the press will not tell you about this is because it doesn't piss off liberals and it doesn't piss off conservatives. It makes both happy so you will never hear about it. So the little sidebar under there is as AI gets into your news feed, the only thing you will see is what outrages you or scares the hell out of you. So what I'm saying is break that cycle, source the information from better places. Perfect one is Hans Rosling. Now Hans Rosling, this one's a little difficult because he doesn't do podcasts, he's dead, right? So, but he wrote the book Factfulness, Factfulness. Uh, he did uh, half a dozen TED Talks and he did a super cool video with the BBC about 13 years ago when he was alive, where they showed you his data in, in augmented reality in front of him. And he's a really tall Swedish professor, so it's kind of like listening to a Muppet. It's really quite entertaining. And the video is four minutes long. It's called The Joy of Stats. He proves to you in four minutes that you're the safest, healthiest, wealthiest human being ever to walk the earth. It's one of the best videos ever seen. So the argument here is, is that uh, around female empowerment or some of the advancements out there. The argument here is this, uh, when, you, when you exit extreme poverty, leaving $1.90 US a day and get to uh, $13.69 a day, not a lot of money, what ends up happening is the person suddenly is not starving anymore. They suddenly start to care about the future. That puts a natural cap on population. So the UN has said, now this is the miraculous side, we're raising 168,000 human beings out of extreme poverty today and have been for the last 25 years in a row and it goes unreported. Why? Because what happens is if, if you're liberal, if you lean left, it makes you happy because it ends the scourges that plague humanity. 
right? If you're conservative, it makes you happy because if you got a nice car in your driveway and a hot spouse at home, you're not strapping a bomb to your butt to blow anybody else up, right? It's really good for geopolitical stability. So, and that's one of the best things that can happen. So I'm coaching a woman right now out of St. Louis who has taken personal responsibility to end extreme poverty in the world. What she does is she overpays mostly illiterate women to weave baskets that she sells mostly at Whole, Fu Whole Foods. She pays two and a half time free, free trade wages. That turns the woman into an economic juggernaut of the family. Now, what I'm about to say is gonna be rough. In the 28 countries she operates in, for these mostly illiterate women, it is considered manly to beat your wife. That ends the second the woman becomes the economic juggernaut of the family. Because either the dude steps in line or she's got the cash now to leave him. The second thing she does with that money is she buys uh, educational supplies for her children. This woman's work is going to end illiteracy in the world within the next 25 years all pursuits that lead to good things. One of the themes I want you to put on your radar screen, I'd like you to write this down. It's called conscious capitalism. Conscious capitalism. For example, how many people here would say, uh, would self-identify that they have strong political, uh, strong religious convictions? All right, so this is where evolutionists get religion wrong. Religion uh, well, well, they concentrate on the afterlife, and frankly, anybody telling you they know what's going to happen in the afterlife, it's kind of lying to themselves and lying to you. It's a question of faith. Would you agree with that? All right, so the argument here is, so when atheists try to attack religion about the afterlife, they're kind of off the rails, because what they're doing is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The real truth of it is, religion creates communities. Does that sound right to you? Much, much more importantly than that. Ancient religion have ancient wisdom in them. See, the difference between a religion and a cult is, a cult, especially a political cult, I'll get back to that in a moment, doesn't recognize that the battle for good and evil, so the battle for good and evil in a new religion happens between human beings. What an ancient religion teaches us is no, the battle for good and evil happens internally inside all of us. Why is that so important? is we are dividing into political camps. As you become more secular as a society, you, that, that religiosity, that need for religion spills into the political sphere, and then they assign evil in the other, as opposed to recognizing it exists in every one of us. Why is that so pernicious? The reason why that's so pernicious is because we are creating a new religion of national politics. Hard right, hard left. There is no center anymore. Does that sound right to you? What I'm arguing is we need to actually get back to the center. We need to recognize human beings are human beings. Religion can help us do that. So keep that in the back of your mind. How does that affect your business model? And what your role in as a business leader is something called conscious capitalism. We can elicit the spirituality of commerce and people. Because frankly, if your employees are coming to your place of business to pay their lousy bills, you're gonna get a certain level of output. When they're coming there to leave the world a better place, you are going to get a better level of output. Doesn't that make sense? This woman has a seminar on conscious capitalism, something to keep in the back of your mind. So back to this, Brazil. Brazil, although it's an economic juggernaut, giant pain in the tush to do business with, if you're investing in it, knock yourself out. If you're expanding into it, pump the brakes. So giant pain and a tush to do business with. Mexico, Mexico looks like a Hershey's kiss. What does that mean? That means Mexico has more people turning every single age in Mexico for almost a hundred years. It's like they don't have birth control in that country. That, what that means is that as that young male cohort enters into its high crime prone years, you're gonna see Mexico look like a dumpster fire. And the cameras of the world, do they focus on human flourishing or human misery? So what you're gonna see lots of fodder for all the news cameras to focus on Mexico for the next decade or so as that young male cohort enters its high crime prone years. But then as it starts to exit that high crime prone years, enters its high productivity years, Mexico is gonna get boring. And then the cameras of the world will turn their attention to something else also the reason why they're of little or no strategic benefit. 
So what you're looking at here is Mexico is going to be an economic juggernaut eventually. So it'd be a good place to put like a, foot, a beachhead in in about a decade or so. So a good place to invest in. In the meantime, it's going to be a phenomenal trading partner for the United States. Any questions so far? So here's the key. You don't want to get overwhelmed by data. You want to recognize this is readily available and free, by, by the way. Yes. Can you say that a little louder? Okay, cool. All right, so we got 129 for Canada, approximately 36 for Brazil, and the balance would be Mexico. It's the least most common of all of them. All right, so the other two ingredients for prosperity above uh, compulsory education and female empowerment is democracy and attitude towards trade. The freer the attitude towards trade, the, the more likely that country will live up to its potentiality, right? So the, the key here is it's fast, effective, and cheap. You can, you can be able to predict the health of any economy in the world decades in advance. Partially the reason why is because people do not legally immigrate to other countries at 50 years old. They legally immigrate at 30 years old. So what would happen is if your country had a dearth of 50 year olds headed or were headed for one like we are, the country would have to anticipate that up to 20 years in advance. And is that what governments do? The governments fix tomorrow's problem today and they fix yesterday's. So this is almost a cause set in motion. All right, so moving on. So this next chart here, I got to give you a little bit of a caveat. Someone, um, Someone wrote in the electronic survey after I presented recently, uh, I don't know why Mark Peratt talks about the baby boom generation anymore. They're no longer relevant. Now, that's a special type of stupid. I want to kind of head off the pass here. It's so dumb, I got to assume it was a dude, right? So a young dude probably. So, so the situation here is this. I talk about the baby boomers on this chart simply because they're old enough to have hit every rung on the ladder I'm about to show you. We have the actual data. We're not speculating about what Gen Z is going to do in their retirement years. You get me? Also, when you hear uh, marketers or uh, market researchers interview 20 year olds about what they're going to do later in life, that, like, you remember what you were like when you were 20? Right? So uh, there was a paradigm shift that happened in most of your lives. How many people have kids? Did your life change when you had your first one? That was sarcasm, by the way. All right, so the situation is once a person has kids, you might as well screw their shoes to the floor. They're not moving anymore. They're not doing all the wild, crazy stuff that they thought they would do in their 20s. It's not about you anymore. Like, when I, I've got, remember, I got four boys under 24. No one prepared me for that. My first son was born. You, like, no one told me, oh, there's going to be a human being you're willing to step in front of a moving bullet for. Like, did anyone prepare you for that? Now, I'm the seventh of seven. My mother used to like to say, uh, she, when our, our first was born, she would take us to the nursery and point at our newborn and say, did you ever think your parents could love you that much? And there's no way you can know until you have your first kid, right? So the situation is once you have your first kid, it's almost like a cause set in motion. You get really, really boring. And that's good for us when we're trying to forecast the future. So we're just going to see right now how boring. Now, I'm going to encourage you guys to write down these numbers here. And the reason why is because you can't get this from the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the CIA. This is uh, proprietary information. This took us six months to put this chart together. I'd spare you that time in your research. How old were baby boomers when they moved out of their parents' home? No one wants to take a guess? All right, 18 is the most common answer, but it's incorrect. It makes sense from a logic and reason perspective because the majority didn't attend college, let alone finish college. The, um, but back in those days, especially, if you didn't attend college, usually you had to do some type of apprenticeship work to afford the economic event of moving out. Make sense? So that, that magic age is 22. Now I'm sparing the decimal points here for speed. How old do you think baby boomers were when they got married? <laughs> All right, so th there is some statistical disbelief you're going to have to dispel because these are national statistics. These are not like Springfield, Missouri statistics, right? And certain real estate markets cause everything to happen later in life, like where I'm from in New York. Like uh, all these numbers are too young in New York, by the way. 
So when I'm doing a New York audience, I got to get them to dispel their statistical disbelief the other direction. So it's actually 25. It's a peak age, the baby boom generation for marriage. How old are they when they had their first kid? 27. Correct. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Gen Z and millennials. There's some absolutely miraculous things that are happening for Gen Z. And some tragic things. So Gen Z, it's the lowest level of vehicular death of any generation ever studied. It's the lowest level of substance abuse and alcoholism of any generation ever studied. It's the lowest level of first time live births to teenage mothers. Really good thing, by the way. That is considered so economically threatening, the federal government studies it by federal mandate. And the reason why is because if you experience what's referred to as delayed parenting, delayed parenting, which means you're having your first child north of 25 years old and post marriage, you can eliminate any chance of poverty in any of those human beings lives. You can end the cycle of poverty, as they say. So that's the good side of things. The bad side of things is it's the highest suicide rate of any generation ever studied, specifically teenage female suicide rates. And one of the things that we, we have to recognize is there are some significant differences between the male and female brains. That's Luann Brenzadine's book, The Female Brain or The Male Brain. The reason why is because we need to move the needle on this. Teenage female suicide rates are up 75% in the last five years. The causal factor appears to be social media and the algorithmization of so so, uh, social media. So in 2009, this is, this is Jonathan Haidt's theory. In 2009, uh, Facebook invents the like button and is, uh, Twitter invents the retweet and every other social media platform copies them in some way, shape or form. That enables them to algorithmatize engagement on their platforms. And females are significantly more sensitive to social comparison. Does that make sense? So what ends up happening is by the time middle schoolers get, uh, get smartphones, the uh, self-harm starts to skyrocket and suicide rates are now hockey sticking. That's something we need to move the needle on. Now, I used to say, I didn't hear a single politician talking about that, but I've got good news on that. So Senator Rosenthal out of Connecticut has instituted a bill that will, uh, is looking to regulate the algorithms within social media in an attempt to minimize these suicides. That's a good thing. We want to support that type of work. So, and in the meantime, how you can support it, if you have uh, children or grandchildren of that age, you want to make sure they're not on social media until high school, which is a difficult thing to actually implement. And the reason why is because the brain is more mature at that stage and they're more likely to be able to handle the social comparison as opposed to middle school ages. All right, so moving on. Millennials, millennials are doing things differently. 40%, 40% of first time live births last year were to non-wed mothers. That's a shocking statistic. Now, the reason why I teach that is for two reasons. The first is don't moralize something before you understand it. What Philip Tetlack refers to is you don't you want to stay in investigation mode before you move to prosecution mode. All right. So there's some human universals I'd like you to write down. The first one is we are born illiterate. We are born innumerate, which means we do not understand math. We do not understand uh, large statistics and small statistics. All right. And frankly, the education system does a real terrible job of making us numerate. Right. We are also born um, ignorant. So anything you had to go to school for, especially something you had to go to school for for a really long time is because it doesn't come natural to us. And we are born to witch hunt. So we we are essentially born bad lawyers. We decide way too quickly which side of the argument we're on. Then we seek only the first evidence that proves our side of the argument correct. So why is social media such a cluster? So what you're better off doing is staying off social media and do yourself a favor, delete Twitter from your phone. You are never going to find peace of mind on Twitter. It is a useless pursuit to go argue with other people on the internet because the internet at its worst is an idiotic echo chamber. 
it brings out the worst in humanity. What we want to be doing is utilizing it for what it needs to be utilized for, which is proper research. And do you think people who just got their smartphone know how to, how to research properly? How many of your friends in the last 24 months have become epidemiologists with, with no medical degree? Anyone here relate to that? You see what I'm saying? So pump the brakes. What we want to do is be more humble. Again, ancient religion teaching. Start with humility. All right, so back to this, the uh, millennials. What you don't want to do is say, okay, well, 40% of first-time live births last year in the United States were to non-wed mothers. That's terrible. It doesn't mean they won't cohabitate or get married eventually. However, it is a very European thing to do. And European things to do are good if they're food or fashion, not if they're economic. So keep that in the back of your mind as we build out the rest of this chart. How old do you think baby boomers were when they purchased their first home? Anyone? 31. How old do you think they were when they uh, fully furnished that first home? Thirty-six. How old do you think they are when they purchase a trade-up property, if they ever do? Anyone? Forty-two. How old do you think they are when they fully furnish the trade-up property, assuming they bought one? Nobody? Forty-six. And how old do you think they are when they purchase a vacation property, if they ever do? 52. How old do you think they are when they purchase a dream vacation property? Because that's the starter vacation property age. How old do you think they are when they purchase a dream vacation property? It's, it's 67. This is more like a oceanfront, some spectacular home, that type of thing. How old do you think they are when they purchase a retirement property, if they ever do? Anyone? What makes you say 75? All right, well, I appreciate your honesty. The reason why I ask is every once in a while, I run into someone that has a more intimate relationship to something I'm looking to uh, analyze. The government takes a really long time, and then the way they do it, I have no control over. The number they have is 70. Now, I want you to circle that number, though. I believe that number is somewhat dubious. I believe it's a homogenization of 55 and over housing and assisted living facility. I'd rather see those two separated out, assuming I'm right about that. But frankly, I don't know and don't care because I have no clients that are in that space right now. The moral of that is if your organization is uh, in that space, you need to know and you need to care. That turns, on, uh, turns me on to um, the single most important thing I have to share with you here today. You need to know the magic age of the end user of your product or service. Your organization needs to know the magic age of the end user of your product or service. There's a trick I use to get people to write things down. I repeat myself slowly until they do. You need to know the magic age of the end user of your product or service. That is a game changer. Now, I got a rule, too after doing a couple of hundred of these if i say something clever you're welcome to steal it if you say something clever i'm going to steal it so picture i'm in cleveland there's a guy uh, uh, uh a guy sitting over on this side of the room puts both hands up he goes hold on a second mark so what you're saying is if i'm b2b maybe like connell insurance if i'm b2b i gotta know my b's c's i said dude i'm totally stealing that and frankly um if you don't know your b2c's You've never done strategic planning. You're guilty of wishful thinking. You guys like quotes? This one's worthy. Me no likey wishful thinking. Well, you guys are chuckling about that, but I'm not chuckling about that. The reason why I'm not chuckling about that is I talked two CEOs at a suicide in the financial crisis. Never want to have conversations like that again. And frankly, if you were a New York audience, I'd be using different words than long and arduous. They were making stupid decisions at the previous top of the market. So what I am is a woodshed meeting for them. Take them out to the woodshed and slap them around out of love. Because you know what happens when the economy goes good? People get fat, dumb, and happy. When it goes good for, let's say, 13 years in a row, wink, wink, people get fatter, dumber, and happier. No, no, no. 
We want to make sure that we're not guilty of that. We need to understand our customers at an intimate level. We need to understand our customer's customer, and we are living in unprecedented times for that right now. So let me walk you through an exercise and uh, show you how I could prove that to you. Let's pretend I'm going to take you from the macro, take you into the micro. Let's say everybody in here is a residential contractor. How important would it be for you to know how many people are between the ages of 31 and 46 years old in your neck of the woods? Readily available and free. Please write this down. My congressional district. My congressional district. You Google my congressional district, hit the link. It pulls you to the function on census.gov. And uh, you put in any zip code in the United States, it spits back all sorts of useful demographic information to you for free. The catch is they won't help you interpret the data. You can build your own age pyramids based on this information. Why is that important for you guys to know? It's so the think tank at the company can form alignment about are we pointing the energies of the organization in the right direction? Everybody in the think tank needs to be aware of this. So why am I talking to you about this? to increase the likelihood of that happening because your company likely doesn't know about this. You know how I know that? If you flip over your handout, you'll see a picture of my book. It spent four years on, uh, as the highest rated econometrics book on Amazon and sold 750 total copies. That qualifies for a whoop a dee do right? So this was a life lesson for me. I learned, I didn't know enough about marketing back, back then. I recognized if I don't mention the word depression or some type of existential threat in an econometrics book title, you won't buy the book. So rest assured when I rewrite this book, we're going to change the title to you're going to die unless you buy this book. It would have sold thousands, right? Maybe tens of thousands. So the, the argument here is, is that we want to understand our customers at an intimate level. I need you to put on your radar screen. Please write this down. ARC GIS. ARC GIS. A-R-C GIS. It's Geospatial Information Systems. So picture I'm presenting in Buffalo. I run into a company that just hired an ARC GIS specialist. They call me up after I present. They said, look, Mark, we just hired these two kids out of SUNY Buffalo. One's a marketing guru. The other one's an ARC GIS specialist. I'm like, this is awesome. Because uh, is anyone here familiar with ArcGIS? No? You, you need to become so, right? Now, it's not free. It'll run you somewhere around $500 to $1,000 to download it, right? So you do it as a corporation. But this is what this company did. So to defer some of the costs for hiring these kids, these hotshot marketing guys, they offered this. This was an energy company, by the way, offered their services to their, their clientele. So they said, would you sit in on a Zoom call while we, while we counsel this one company? I said, absolutely. So I'm sitting in and I'm listening to the, the marketing expert figure out what the magic age of the end user of this company is. Now they are a home generator company. Now what do you think the demographics are? What does a person look like that buys a home generator? You know what I'm talking about, right? Power goes out, power goes back on, that kind of thing. What does that person look like? 55 year old females in flood zones. So as soon as they figured out what the avatar, the magic age of the end user of the product services, who is that customer? The other one started building out something called a heat map. That's where you take geospatial information, GPS maps, and delete everything from them except for geography and anything that you're looking for. So that creates a heat map. So what is this heat map they're building? All the flood zones in Western New York. And then the kid overlays on top of the flood zones, 55 year old females. How's that for surgical marketing? So there's a demographic component in GIS. So this is something you need to have on your radar screen at your company. Why am I telling you? Because I'm gonna pad your resume with this information. So information is power if it's implemented properly. So I want you aware of it so you can tap the shoulder of the CFO, the CEO, the CIO, the CMO, what have you, get them pointing the company's energies in the right direction so you will handle the next recession better. All right, so what I wanna do now is, uh, well, let's, let's play this question game. Let's say, remember, you're all residential contractors. And the, the, the number of people turning 31 to 46 years old in your neck of the woods is decreasing for the next 15 years. What should you be doing with that information? Selling your company to somebody who doesn't know that. 
right? That's the best answer I've ever heard from an architect, believe it or not, in Brookfield, Wisconsin. So that knowledge is power. You need to know who, how many people are moving to your, your neck of the woods. How many people are moving away from your neck of the woods? How, how many people are, are sticking? So one of the uh, pieces of advice that I give CEOs, and I'd like you to give this to them uh, by extension, is to go on a long vacation. Go on a longer vacation than they normally would. If they normally go on a week, send them for two. If they normally go on for two, send them for a month and send with them a legal pad. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna write down every freaking thing your office calls them about while they're away on the vacation. Because what we need to do is free up their time to become the chief strategist of the company. Their homework is to take that laundry, uh, that laundry list of all those things back to you and your desk. And you guys are gonna figure out policies and procedures to make sure that that never happens again. All right, so uh, uh, are we recording this? Okay, cool. All right, so play them the recording about what I just said. What happens here is they'll have a better vacation from it. Second thing is their company will actually be worth more. I'll explain that when we get to valuations and the trends and valuations. All right, so back to this. I'm going to take you from the micro, take you back to the macro. Spending increases after we move out of our parents' home, peaking at 49 and one half years old plateauing out to 55 and then decreasing every year the rest of our lives. Anyone want to take a stab at why 49 and a half years old is the peak spending age of the average American? Anyone? <laughs> right, well, you don't want to be too smart for your own good. I want you to think about, um, I want you to think about it prosaically, very prosaic. What do you got? There you go. All right. This is, this is one of the offensive things I have to say. This might come as a shocker to some people in this room. But human beings like to have sex. Does that shock anybody? And that sometimes sex results in children. Shocker number two. All right, so what happens here is this. They had their first kid at 27. That kid moves out at 22. What's 22 plus 27? 49. Does that resonate with you guys? You now know something that the federal government doesn't know. <laughs> I mean, might, might, I might not have any more kids at that age, right? So the situation here is at 49 and a half years old, first child moves out. Now we got to have a little bit of a, a, a come to religion around statistics here. Are HR directors normal? No, you're not normal, right? So I have the largest survey of privately held CEOs and C-levels in the country. The average work week of sea levels is 55 hours a week. Is that normal for normal employees? No, it's 35 hours a week. Three 80 year old males reported working 80 hours a week on my survey. So what does that mean? Your spouse is correct about you. You're abnormal. So what you have to do is when you're thinking about marketing, you got to think like a normal person, but then act like a, a business leader. So what we want to do is uh, this next question is big. What does a normal person do with the disposable income after their first kid moves out? I think it's much more prosaic than that. I think the first thing they start to do, that comes later, what the first thing they start to do is start to pay down the previous decades of debt spending. When they were taking their kids to Disney World or some god awful place like that. The, uh, I hate Disney World so much that if you like Disney World, that means I don't like you, so lay low. All right, so the last time I was there, it was, uh, it was the last week of August. It was a gun to the back of my head. It was a million six in the shade. We were at that Batan death march that is Epcot Center. Kids are rolling around on the ground all overstimulated, screaming and crying. And I walk past the kid, look at the dad and go, you don't see that in the brochure, do you? All right, so people waste their money on dopey stuff like that, accumulate debt, and then have to start to pay down that debt. Second thing is, um, at 55 years old, there's a second inflection point here. Second kid moves out. Nuclear family, right? Then you, you enter into what I call empty nester spending syndrome. See, prior to that, it's really hard to get a 22-year-old to invest in the 401k. Agreed? Right? You usually have to do some type of psychologically manipulative tactic. It's almost impossible to get a 55-year-old to not invest in the 401k. And the government incentivizes it, causing you to fail your testing. And supposedly that's your fault. You're welcome. No, the situation is all of that is highly predictable. You have to build it into the system so that you're taking it, uh, uh, psychologically manipulating the 22-year-olds so there's more of them in there and you're more likely to pass your testing. 
So what happens here is something happens in 55 where spending starts to decrease because you're now suffering from empty nester spending syndrome. So spending on cars goes down, spending on housing goes down, spending on walkers goes up, spending on medication goes up, spending on restaurants would normally go up if it wasn't for COVID. So what we're really talking about here is the difference between a hurricane and a hurricane. Did you guys lose that in my accent? All right, at 25 years old, a hurricane is a drink in New Orleans. At 75 years old, it's a cane you buy on late night television. It's a series of tubes, you got a bungee, bungee cord going through it. You let go of it, it snaps to a cane. It's got a knuckle joint in the bottom and three prongs. So you put it on any land terrain, you don't fall over anymore. Hurricane, hurricane, spending patterns change. Think at 22, think cocaine. At 44, think Rogaine. Spending patterns change. Are you relevant? Is your business model relevant for the change? Do you see what's behind what's happening here? People are ridiculously predictable. I'll give you an example. Myself, my dad, I'm a 55 year old New York suburbanite with four boys under 24. My dad's a 94 year old empty nester living in an assisted living facility in Delray Beach, Florida. Who spends more money, me or him? Hands down, I spend money on him, right? Proof positive that. Now, I'm the seventh of seven, so Irish Catholic, right? So in the rare occasion, my father would come back to the Northeast. Like, I don't think he's gonna come back anymore, but the last time he was up was proof positive of this, that he does not spend money. We were, uh, it was 2019, we're at an Irish wake and my dad wanted to, ha wanted to come. And maybe you guys can relate to this with your, with your fathers. My dad suffers from old man mayor routine. You get what I'm talking about? He wanders crowds, kissing babies, shaking hands, playing mayor. You get what I'm talking about? All right, so picture we're at the wake and, and my dad's wandering the wake, kind of like where you are standing up over there. And, and my sister leans into me. She goes, she goes, uh, we got to do something about dad. And I look over, I go, what are you talking about? What we got to do about dad? She goes, um, he's a mess. And I look over and sure enough, the dude's a mess. I said, I'm not doing anything about that. One day I'm going to look exactly like him. And I don't know about you felt, I'm not going to speak for ladies. This doesn't go over well with the ladies, but guys, aren't you looking forward to it? Like, I can't wait to wear my pajamas in the daytime and have ear hair like a Rastafarian. I can't wait to no longer care. And I'm betting I'm not the only dude in this room that feels the same way. I got, I got any brothers here? Any brothers? Yeah, I'm telling you, that's going to be a bad day for Tommy Hilfiger when we take over, right? And that's predictable. So now we're getting back to the rough part of the presentation. The rough part is this. All, uh, all human beings, all complex life, reproduces sexually. So why is that? Well, according to epidemiology theory and evolutionary theory, it comes down to pathogens. So um, over the eons of time that we spent on planet Earth with pathogens, had we evolved to, uh, uh, to evolve to reproduce asexually, we'd all have the same DNA. We'd all look the same, be the same sex, and then be vulnerable to pathogens in this way. What is a virus? It's a being, a single-celled organism that's wandering through the world, deaf, dumb, and blind, gets into our lungs mostly, in most cases of viruses, cracks the code on our DNA, and then can use our lungs and our, uh, our lungs for sexual reproduction and food, and then can out-evolve us. The term is called exponentiality. So what does that mean? If you're conservative, you've been frustrated because epidemiologists will never say anything definitive. Now, the reason why they won't is because a virus can mutate so quickly, by the time the words come out of an epidemiologist's mouth, the virus could mutate into something other than he just or he or she just said. It's that fast. So they can out-evolve us, stay ahead of us. So what does that mean? What is sexual reproduction? You're taking the DNA of one party, the DNA of another party, and jumbling them together in the next generation. It's an encryption code against pathogens. So over the eons of time, if one pathogen cracks the code on one person's DNA, they won't have the, D the code to all our DNA. Had they, had we evolved to, to evolve asexually, then they would have had the code and wiped us out in a, in a speck of evolutionary time period. So it's a code against pathogens. What does that do? That makes us, we gotta acknowledge, we've been sexually reproductive longer than we've been human. So that creates a cascade of behavior patterns that are different between males and females even, subtly different. So what that means is that's what explains why there is no economy in the world where 
women buy Porsches to impress scantily clad men. People are that boring. So the way I, the way I look at it is, okay, we got human universals and we have cultural universals. So let's say you were going to take an exotic trip with your family. You're going to go to India and you take with you a legal pad. If you sat there and wrote down all the things that you see that were common to the environment you grew up in, those are human universals. What you'll see is parents taking care of children. You'll see smiling, laughing, and the use of language, but you won't hear the same language. So the language used is a cultural evolution, but the human universals are all there because people are people and we're freaking boring. So all you got to do is take ownership of this. You bake it into your strategic planning, your marketing planning, your investment planning, and then your, all those plans become more durable and more sustainable. Clear? Any questions? Okay, so here we're going to take a 15-minute break. When we come back, I'm going to teach you how you can predict the next recession. Sound good? You do a second part to that exercise, you will never need to listen to an economist ever again. So make sure you come back. I had some uh, interesting questions on the break too. So I, I wanna cover this and we're, this the, the second half actually, hopefully you've got brain cells left for me because this is where we melt brains. All right, we're getting much, much more focused here. And one of the things that we're gonna be talking about is enterprise value. But we're gonna start with the fact that we haven't had a recession in 13 years. So what is this? You wanna be um, filling in what each of the, this acronym means. It means trucking, manpower, or temporary staffing, and pallet and packaging. Trucking, manpower, pallet, and packaging. Those are the undisputed leading indicators of the economy. Any economist will tell you that. What they won't tell you is that they're not the leading indicator of every phase of the market cycle. So trucking, pallet, and packaging are the indicators on the way down. And what it, what it comes down to is something bought, something shipped. So I'm former Wall Street. Now, do you think we could have waited around for economic reports? That would be a hell no, right? Because what is an economic report? It's a, it's a history lesson. It's like a giant rear view mirror that you're trying to drive forward with, right? So the, if you wait around for economists to tell you you're in a recession, you've already been in a recession. So we got to prepare for the recession. And when should we be preparing for the next recession? Right the hell now. And the reason why is because it's been 13 years since the last one. We are way overdue. So what we want to do is have some type of seismic warning about this. So, Tom, I'm picking on you in the background. All right, so picture, let's say that you were able to uh, steer some of your marketing efforts towards these leading indicators. Get the relationships with them, maybe even give them a discount just to get their business from them, and then track the performance of them. Any benefits company should be able to do this. So that this way they're able to track the performance based on are they hiring now, are they letting people go, that sort of thing. And then you give that performance numbers to the rest of your clientele as a value added, as a customer service thing. So then what, happens, what ends up happening is you have a seismic warning on the next, uh, the next uh, recession, the next stock market collapse, which isn't far away. So uh, what happens here, though, is trucking, pallet, and packaging signify the way down. They're not the lagging indicator on the way back up, but they're not the leading indicator on the way back up. The leading indicator would be temp service demand. And the way it works like this, for any of you in, in manufacturing will know this. As we start the recession, I believe even in Missouri, it is illegal not to make payroll. Is that correct? Okay, so certainly that's the case in New York. So what happens is as revenue starts to decline, the very first thing is when you get, catch wind that we're in a recession, you got to reevaluate your org chart. And these companies, trucking especially, will give manufacturing a leading indicator by one month, typically. So now you know what's, what's happening uh, in there because you have the leading indicator. Then what you're doing is you start to reevaluate the org chart, see who's essential and who's superfluous, and you start letting go of, this, uh, of the superfluous ones as, re, uh, as revenue starts to dry up. Then you get to what you think is the bottom of the market. Typically, it's about nine months afterwards. Recessions last 18 months now, and they're typically uh, shaped like a U, not like a V. There's no quick re rebound. And frankly, what we went through last year with COVID was not a recession. How we knew we weren't in a recession was because our trucking, manpower, pallet, and packaging companies, we couldn't even get them on the phone. By the second month of the shock and 
awe of COVID, they were rocking and rolling so fast they couldn't answer our calls. So we were really confident that this was not going to be a recession. In order to have a recession, you have to have two quarters of negative GDP growth. So we knew we weren't even going to have one, uh, maybe not even one. We certainly weren't going to have two. They were rocking and rolling. So what happens, though, is when the next recession, that also, by the way, increases the likelihood of the next market collapse to be a recession. So, and frankly, the stock market collapses on every president's watch. I'd write that down. Stock market collapses on every president's watch. So the next one's likely to be a recession. So we all want to know is, well, when's that going to happen? These guys will tell us. These are the soothsayers. What you can't do is wait around for economic reports because economists are not soothsayers of the future. They're historians of the past. And that's not without value. It's just not the same value. You get my point? So you're better off hanging out with truckers and asking them how's business. Now, what some people will do, especially this woman in Redondo Beach, she's like, raises her hand. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Truckers are doing terrible. Okay, define terrible. What do you mean? Well, they're complaining they don't have enough truck drivers. Is that terrible for the rest of us? I know it's a pain in the tush for them, but is it terrible for us? No, that's a good thing. That means they have too much demand. So that's what you're really looking for is demand and purchases. Something bought, something shipped. See, when I was on Wall Street, we couldn't wait around for economic reports. What we had to do was use FedEx and UPS. Something bought, something shipped. So we used FedEx and UPS as a seismic warning. That gave us anywhere from a one-day to 90-day warning on corporate earnings. Does that sound good if you're on Wall Street? That is like the holy grail of information right there. The catch is you can't do that anymore because Amazon, is Amazon kicking the hell out of Macy's? Yeah. Are they going to continue to in the next downturn? Yeah, so you can't use FedEx and UPS anymore because that's partial shipping. We want to know actual shipping. What you're really looking for is less than truckload shipping. Are they doing really good? If they're doing really good, we're doing good. If they, they start to turn bad, that's bad for the rest of us. And what we need to have is we need to know when we, are, we should downshift into our recession uh, strategy and then upshift into our expansion phase strategy. But we also have to have a strategy. And what do most companies do? They assume the past equals the future. The number one thing I see in private business is the uh, CEOs and the, the think tank surrender strategy to the sales force. Good idea? No, not a good idea. Are sales forces strategic? No, they're not strategic. They're relationship oriented, right? So that means they kind of live in the here and now. So what, what ends up happening is you don't want to surrender strategy to the sales force because they are also the propulsion and rudder to your company. They're going to steer your company into things. We want to actually educate them about this. We want to run seminars to win them over. And frankly, this you got to write down. No suffering from morning after meeting, morning after conference, none of that. Like how many people have you, have you actually heard wisdom from speakers and then walk in, kick down the door and go, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And you're going to do this. And you're going to do that. No, no, no. Never do that again. Right? It sounds funny in this type of circle, but no, it's not cool. And the reason why is one of the human ver universals you need to write down is human beings are hardwired to make other human beings wrong and ourselves right. So Tom, let me say, let me say I'm your, I'm your head of sales. You kick down my door and you go, Mark, you're going to do this and you're going to do that and you're going to do this. I'll be sitting there like, yeah, Tom, that's an awesome idea. Like last time when you heard that other speaker, that was a good idea too. And then the time before that, that was a good idea too. Because how many people here, your organizations have started initiatives and then not followed through on those initiatives? You see where I'm going with this? So in the back of their mind, they're sitting there going, yeah, let's see if this initiative sticks. Or the guy yesterday when I was presenting said, yeah, this too will pass, right? So what we got to do is make sure it's their idea. I'll explain to you what I mean by that. So hold me accountable to making sure you understand how to implement this with the rest of the, of, of the team, how to get them to take ownership of it. But back to this. Okay, so staffing actually signifies the incline. What I mean by that is as we're declining, uh, uh, springing loose the, the superfluous employees, we're, we're keeping the essential ones. You get to the bottom of the, uh, of the market that you think, you're hoping it's the bottom of the economy. That's typically signified with a surprise order from one of your best customers. But now maybe you lack the manpower to honor that order. Well, then you got to hire back. When well, you're at the bottom of the market, you're going to hire back permanent or you're going to hire back temporary services. 
part-timers. You see where I'm going with that? So what you have to have is a relationship with a temp service company. So as, temp, as soon as temp service spikes, that's the end of the, the recession. So remember, you need to downshift into your recession resistance strategy. So you need to have a relationship with a truck driver so you, you understand what's going on there. And the expand, uh, expansion phase strategy in, with uh, temp service demand. That's only part one, though. Part two is you got to look back at 2008, 2009. I know that's not a fun thing to look back at. If you're in your company, you might already know this in the back of your head. If you're not, you got to turn to a trade association to help you figure that out. Or you go back to the people who were in that company and ask them. Go back and analyze. What do the numbers look like in 2008, 2009? So what, what I'm doing now is teaching you how to be a mutual fund manager. You're putting on your mutual fund manager hat looking at the, the business as if it's an investment. How market sensitive is it? Did you drop 5% like a dentist or a lawyer? I actually did a dental conference on March of 2009 and they were morose. And I said, I said, what's up? Why is everyone so bummed out? And they said, well, we're down. I'm like, it's March of 2009. Of course you're down. I go, how down on you? They look, looked around. I'm like, I'm down like 5%. I'm like, what are you seven years old? I'm talking to companies down 65%. I want to throw my, my mic at them and walk off the stage. Like, get over yourselves, right? So the deal is if you're down 5%, if that's your industry, it's down, eh, you probably don't have to do this exercise. You're down 65%, like a concrete manufacturer, you got to do this exercise, right? Second part to that, when did you feel the bad? Did you feel the bad in 2008? You're a leading indicator. If you felt the bad in 2009, you're a lagging indicator. Like who here's a, a contractor? I know I ran into one guy. So your contractors, you know, I'm not going to be calling you up saying, hey, you know, are you confident in the economy? No, because you got contracts. How long are your contracts? So, pff, you, dude, you can sit, sit here, fold your arms, watch everyone else in the room catch on fire and go, oh, it hasn't affected me yet. I guess I'm immune. That would be dumb. No, you don't want to be that, right? So, but the idea is you don't have to worry. You're a lagging indicator. So you don't have to do this part of the exercise. So if you don't have contracts and you're in a transactional business, you lean towards the 2008. So you have to do this exercise. You got to be aware of this. Again, nag the think tank at the company to point the company's energies in the right direction. If you do so, you can create a recession resistant company and handle this next downturn better than your competition. Sound good so far? And that's all we have to do. All right, so lastly, it's a Chevette. Does everyone here know what a Chevette is? You sure? All right, so for those of you who don't know what a Chevette is, it's a super sexy car. More sarcasm, right? In fact, I was in uh, Albuquerque, and the woman who was running everything was doing like a, like a whiteboard, and she wrote the word Chevette with an S, and then I had to explain to her it was a super sexy car and then what sarcasm means. All right, you couldn't paint flames down the side of that thing and make it look sexy, right? It was like, it was like driving, it was like just terrible. All right, but what it is, it's a stripped down version of your flagship product. See, some of your business models have to ramp up for something like that. That's what sells in recessions. All right, so picture, I'm doing a keynote in New York and a company out of Brooklyn calls me up and they say, Mark, we love your, your, your Chevette idea. We think the market's going to collapse soon too. What, what would you do if you were us? And I said, uh, what do you do? They said, we make kosher lollipops. Now, before you start chuckling, they got an 80% profit margin. Zygazunt. Anyone know what I mean by that? Well, I was in Dolphin, Alabama, and I used the word chutzpah, and they were like, that sounds Jewish. I'm like, well, you're not wrong. All right, so it means be well in Yiddish, right? So like 80% like profit margin. Why are we even having this conversation? They said, well, this is our flagship product. What we're concerned about is as soon as we hit a recession, uh, we're going to suffer price compression. We're going to have to lower our prices and maybe able to not be able to get them back up when everything takes off again. I said, well, I think you're overthinking it a little bit, but what you're really looking for is an insurance plan against price compression. It's easy. It's a new logo, new packaging. So you take the existing product, you wrap it in the new logo, new packaging. You don't launch it until the recession is, is confirmed. And then you launch it as a cheaper alternative because you're the kosher lollipop company with a heart. This isn't rocket science, guys, right? So let me just tell you how not rocket science is. I'll guarantee you everyone in this room is a better student than me. All right? I went to a college where if you could roll a joint left-handed, you were dean's list. And they pulled me aside after six months and told me I was one of the 25 worst students in the college. And I was like, percent? And they're like, no. 
right? So I was like, damn, I got to change my attitude. So that's the reason why I rewrite books now. What I figured out was, okay, let me take the reading material to the library, rewrite it longhand in pen, and then I could beat the professor on their own tests. My point about this is your sales force can understand this. Your employees can understand this because I was a 25th worst student in the college and I know this. You get what I'm saying? We can win them over and make sure they're pointing their energies in the right direction. This way you ride through this next downturn as a breeze. Any questions on what I've talked about here so far? Food for thought. Now we get to where the rubber meets the road in all of this. This is what I've been preparing you for. Okay, turn to that page in your handout. You got people at your table. Except Mike, nobody likes you. You're sitting by yourself over there, dude. All right, so maybe you want to find some other people to share this with. What you want to do is, is form at least groups of two. Maybe you three ladies on the corner over there. You three guys up here. What you want to do is you want to answer these questions on page six. You want to list every industry you, you can think of that is classically recession resistant and or benefits from the aging of the populations. So everyone here takes Psych 101. Remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You want to write down all of those. You got any bad sections of town in, in Springfield? I haven't been here long enough to know. All right, but if you do, bad sections of town are in permanent recession. So if you see a big advertising sign in a, in a rough section of town, it's a recession resistant business. So I want you to list all the ones you can think of over the next five minutes. All right, get started. All right, guys, I see some big lists here. So let's do this. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna pull you out of this exercise and we're gonna work on it together as a team. All right, so I'm gonna go around to each of the groups, point over in general. You're gonna give me one example that's on your list that you haven't heard yet. But what I want you to do is I want you to sequester your list from what we're gonna to add to, All right? So that you can remember which ones were your ideas as opposed to other people's ideas, okay? So what do you got, Mike? Give me one on your list. Ah, uh, sin. Sin does really well in recessions, really well in recessions. Concept being is if my life stinks, I'm going to fall into my addictions, right? But what does equally well as sin, but is the opposite of sin? Faith, right? So now picture I'm in South Florida and a, a guy got offended by that. And so, well, how do you make money on religion? And the guy sitting uh, basically in your chair goes, well, that's my business model. I'm like, it is? I go, what's your business model? He goes, I'm a liquidator. So as soon as the recession hits, I buy up the chairs from the local hotels because they're not going to put on as many events and I sell them to strip mall churches that spring up because people are bummed out. And then when we get temp service demand spiking, the strip mall church goes belly up because the recession's over. He buys back the chairs at auction and sells them back to the hotels. I'm telling you, I'll take sneaky smarts over IQ any day. Any day. What else you got? Say again? Dentist. Absolutely. What do you got back there? Fast food, any food, you need a farmer three times a day, all right? So the, the only food I don't like, and this isn't just because I'm Irish, don't be thinking that. The deal is, yes, my mom's cooking was like bordered on child abuse, but the deal is that when I analyze restaurants, my concern is if it's a white tablecloth restaurant, it's really recession sensitive, unless they're smart enough to have multiple pricing on their dinner menus. Then the, the, like you, you offer lunch pricing on your dinner menus, like portions smaller, that kind of a thing. You'll keep the customer, but still are negatively affected during recessions. Cool. What else you got? Yeah, guns and ammo. Absolutely. Do you guys know who Adam Carolla is? He was the second half of the Man Show. He's got he's a radio show host out of L.A. He's got this. He's got this hilarious line. He said, "We are so safe, it is sickening," and he's right about that, by the way. World crime is down 70.87%. Anyone familiar with that statistic before I mentioned it? Why not? Doesn't sell anything, right? Is your, your, your politician ever gonna tell you that? Is Ring ever gonna tell you that? But that's scientifically accurate, down 70.87% in the last 20 years. The only people who can tell you the truth, authors. I got that from Steven Pinker. All right, so guns and ammo. What he said was, we're so safe, it's sickening. You don't even need a home security service. All you need to do is hang out an NRA flag because it sends the message. I like guns so much, 
I'm probably cleaning one right now. And maybe you should reconsider your home invasion down the block at the house with cat flags and lawn gnomes. And I was even thinking like, like on Amazon, if you're buying a lawn gnome, you might just need a home security service too. Like you know how they do that, right? So what else you got? What else is on your list? Auto parts, maintenance, all capital letters. I'm coming back to that one. Ladies, what else? A infrastructure, absolutely. Guys, what do you got? Utilities, absolutely. What else you got that you haven't heard yet? Death industry, my favorite of the bunch. You should have said that more confidently. So the death industry, more people are going to keel in the next 40 years than ever died in American history. Days of the Civil War will be dwarfed on a Tuesday or a Wednesday based on how many baby boomers are going to keel, and that industry is willfully unprepared for it. All right, so most fashionable things happen in California, right? And then somehow it gets spread across the United States in various ways, in varying degrees. Well, in the United States, 52% of all funeral choices are now cremation. It's 87% in California. All right, so what does that mean? That means the cremation industry grows from a $9 billion industry today to a $79 billion industry in the next 20 years. Let me just put that in perspective. Let's say you called me up and said, Mark, I got an idea for a startup. How do I get the funding? You got to prove to venture capital that you can produce a 20x multiple in 10 years. That's a compounded 14.4% rate of return per year. The death industry has a 60x multiplier, not including demands based inflation nor international diversification. Juggernaut, right? What else we got? Pharmacy, absolutely. Healthcare has the highest valuation on the street right now. The only way you can have a higher valuation than in healthcare is to be in software because software is scalable. Everyone here understand what I mean by that? Okay, scalable meaning in my software, it doesn't cost me anything more to sell my software to more and more people, right? Almost every other business model is not scalable because it requires infrastructure to sell more stuff to more people. So healthcare is the highest valuation from a demographic perspective. Software has it from a scalability. So the only way you can have a higher valuation than in healthcare is to be in software for healthcare. Got it? What else you got, fellas? Yeah, well, we got that one already. Anything else? Educate. Okay, what I want you to do with education, I want you to put a hyphen in front of the word education and put the word re, re-education. So uh, I was consulting with a company in South Florida. They're a half a billion dollar in revenue for-profit university called Kaiser University. Their key demographic is 35-year-olds. Now, this is just my political convictions here I'm speaking about. But remember, we're not going to be easily offended. If someone comes to the United States that doesn't speak English and take my job, whose fault is it? It's my fault. Now, can your politician ever tell you that? No, because the immigrant doesn't vote yet. Right. So that's oh, that's the that's the trouble. That's the that's the things. You have. Well, no, no, no. So what happens is we have a moral obligation to stay relevant and we must reeducate ourselves once every five years. Well, why am I why am I even bringing this up? Aren't you guys here for continuing education? All right, we'll just move on. All right. So what else you got, fellas? Absolutely. Cheap entertainment, home broadband, without a doubt. One of the the, the only thing I hear about occasionally is, oh, Mark, what about technology? And technology is yes and no. And the reason why is because technology has an extra layer of threat called disruptive technology. So if you're going to be investing in technology, what you want to do is tap the brake and you got to do an extra layer of analysis. So just to make sure that that's so relevant, disruptive technology won't ruin you. What else you got, fellas? Government, all capital letters. Now this one gets a little rough. Now remember, we're gonna take our political convictions and set them aside. What I really want for uh, after hearing me speak is you take your political convictions and do the appropriate thing with them, throw it out the window, right? It's not in the best interest of your mission or your message. Government work, all capital letters. The best book on the subject is by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. The book is called The Righteous Mind. Now, it is a deep dive in the philosophy of conservative thought and liberal thought, the history of it. And it dates back to the dawn of civilization. You are actually genetically predisposed to be more liberal or less liberal 
uh, based on your, uh, your genes, and then your environment, and then your education, and then life experience. But believe it or not, you lean one way or the other, and it comes naturally to you through your genes. The argument that I have is, he does a great job of explaining that the doctrine of the right, there is brilliance in the doctrine of the right, but there's also stupidity in it. There's brilliance in the doctrine of the left, there's also stupidity in it. So what we really need to do is cherry pick the right, cherry pick the left. You know what that's called? That's called the center. Do you know of any news agency that can be centrist and make money? Yeah, don't rack your brain too hard, zip, zero. So what do we have? We have an industrial news complex that is designed to divide us. Now he's missing one thing in his research. It's in my next book on why we're so politically divided. And what that is, is there were 14 genocides in the 20th century, 14. More people died in those genocides than died in all of the wars of the 20th century combined. Every one of those genocides was perpetrated by a one-party system. So the only thing worse than a two-party system is a one-party system. So pump the brakes. So is Fox News your friend? No. You're, you're, they're able to sell their ad space for more money by proving your preconceived conclusions correct. But it's not proof. They're making you right. Just like MSNBC makes their constituency right. And frankly, this you might want to write down. Making people right is wrong. Making people wrong is wrong. I don't know which one's wronger. Right? You could tell English wasn't exactly my forte, right? Numbers are. But the situation is that I think it depends on the circumstance. So we don't want to be doing is making people right or making people wrong. We want to make them win. And how do you make them win? They got to know you're, you're in their corner. Like, does anyone here feel disrespected by me so far? Well, I'm, I'm still getting warmed up. So the deal is, though, is the, the, uh, you got, if you're going to have a conversation about politics or something that's, that's going to be political, because guess what every conversation is these days? Everything's becoming political. So that's called virtue signaling. This you want to write down. The term is called blue lies. Blue lies. What are blue lies? Everybody here know the term white lies, right? Like... What white lies do, the reason why we evolved white lies was to prove loyalty and friendship. And you guys should know this better than my New York audiences. How many people here hunt? There you go. Right? We don't see a lot of that in New York City, right? So that, you know, they hunt other stuff. So, so picture a hunter realizes on some level the primal nature of hunting and how it's mostly a product of luck. It's a certain amount of skill. But that same skilled hunter might come up empty that day where the other hunter might come up with a windfall and some of that's luck. Agreed? Like fishing. Like they don't call it catching. They call it fishing for a reason, right? So what happens is in our ancestral past, loyalty and friendship was vital to survival. So if you took down a large game pre-refrigeration, where's the best place to store the extra meat? In your friend's stomach. So if you're generous that way and you prove loyalty by sharing meat mostly, what ends up happening is they're obligated to return that favor when you have a shortfall. See how that works? So we evolved white lies to tell you. Like I tell you, you look good in that shirt when you don't. What that does is I'm proving friendship and uh, loyalty and friendship. Vital. It's still vital now, but nowhere near as vital as it was in our ancestral past. So what are blue lies? Any dynamic that evolved at the individual level, as soon as you take it up to group dynamics, the dynamics change. It's like a force factor. So what are blue lies? They're, they're white lies told to groups. They are designed to prove loyalty to a coalition. Why do people drive with their pickup trucks with giant Trump flags or you know, some expletive in the word Biden afterwards? The, the other side does the exact same thing. The stupidity exists on both sides. It's the same stupidity. It's we act like we're, we're seeking truth. Like anyone that tells you, we got to do this at all costs. Are they actually seeking truth? Do you think that person analyzed any of those costs? No. It's not about truth. It's about loyalty to a coalition. And that we need to tamp down. What social media has done is done the opposite. And then the worst culprits of them all are the political news.
they are not your friend because it ends really poorly historically. It ends in genocide. We need to wrestle this all back. So here's my argument to you. How do you win over someone who's politically charged? Is to recognize they're not seeking truth. And that's not necessarily in the best interest of them and theirs. So the first thing you have to do is get to recognize that you want to see them succeed. And then you simply hit them with this phrase. Arguments are about who's right. Discussions are about what's right. Because if we sat down, let's say you and I are on the opposite ends politically. And just so everyone here understands in, a, in an effort to be completely transparent here, I'm a liberal. I don't care who you sleep with or what you smoke, right? But I'm fiscally conservative, so that means me, leaves me a man without a party. So I'm, I'm not going to help you pay for that party. You get what I'm saying? So what does that mean? I can be very centrist with things. So I'm the turd in the punch bowl when people get political. All I do is turn to them with a placid face like a therapist or a pastor, and I turn to them and go, well, uh, what sort of evidence do you have to support that claim? And watch the person go, humana, 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 humana. Because people will tell you, if you ask them, do you know how to run a nuclear power plant? Anyone in this room is likely going to say no. But if I ask you, what should we do about the electrical grid in the world? You'll answer the question. Do you see where I'm going with that? That is a blind spot for human nature, exacerbated by the political environment. It, the real key here is you can never play victim to politics ever again. Here's what I mean by that. You got a lot of people counting on you making excellent decisions. Certainly the, third, the think tank at your company certainly does, correct? And this, please write this down. This is going to be a little lengthy here. Through commerce, we are capable of what religion hopes to accomplish and what politicians fail at. That's a lot, so I'll keep repeating myself until you tell me time to. Through commerce, we are capable of what religion hopes to accomplish and what politicians fail at. And that's taking care of large-scale communities. Anyone need me to repeat it? Through commerce, we are capable of what religion hopes to accomplish and what politicians fail at. See, if I want to sound like I'm some cutting edge intellectual, all I have to do is assassinate the character of capitalism and commerce. What that really means is I'm a terrible historian because it's only the best way to ever run a country in the history of countries. So what happens is we can elicit the spirituality of commerce in our employees. Politics doesn't do that because guess what? Politics makes us stupid. The second you politicize something, your IQ drops. This is a study by David Perkins. That's actively being done right now. So my guess is they're going to be able to prove this. That what they're going to do is a series of questions, get you to be political in your mindset, and then ask you some critical thinking questions, and then judge your IQ before and afterwards. Before you, before you politicize something and afterwards, my guess is your IQ is going to drop one standard of deviation. Politics makes us stupid because we actually start to prosecute our moral agenda before we actually even understand what the hell we're trying to analyze. You see where I'm going with this? Politics are for lesser minds. See, the situation is the boots on the ground at your company, that guy wants to play victim to politics, knock yourself out. How many people are counting on that guy making excellent decisions? Two, maybe a dog. How many people are counting on you making excellent decisions? You see what I'm talking about? It's for lesser minds. So now that I got you the right psychology, we're going to play a thought experiment. Your Congress, and I'm the newly elected president. Now, if I got brain one in my head, I already know the stock market collapses on every president's watch. So what do I got loaded and chambered on the day of my inauguration? A stimulus package. Now, if I'm really smart and frankly get Jonathan Hyde on the phone because he'll, he'll answer my phone call because I'm the president of the United States and ask him, what should I be calling this act? Because I got to look like I'm doing something, right? Market collapses. I got to look like I'm doing something. I'm going to call it a jobs creation act. I'm not going to call it a stimulus package because that's highly debatable. If I send you, Congress, a jobs creation act, can you vote against it? Nope. And the reason why is this. This you want to write down. 
because 50% of the people in the United States have a below average IQ. I'd write that down. Now, did I shock anybody with that statement? 50% of the people in the United States have a below average IQ. If I shocked you, you'd be in good company. That shocked Dwight Eisenhower, but that's how statistics work. So you'd look like you're anti-job. That's the thing, folks. So if you're Congress, can you vote against the Jobs Creation Act? So what am I getting back after I send you that act? I'm getting back a blank checkbook of funny money. Because who is the only entity in the United States that can print counterfeit dollars and not get in trouble for it? The federal government. Now, I do need permission to use colorful language. Is anyone here going to be offended if I use colorful language? Warning. All right, so I'm in Brookfield, Wisconsin. There's a banker in the room. The banker stands up at the end of the presentation and says, Mark, my main takeaway from this presentation is I'm not going to bitch anymore about what they do with my tax dollars. It's my job to anticipate the stupid moves the federal government's going to make with that money and then task my bankers with coming back and earning it back for me. Is he playing victim to politics? Is he... Uh, See, this is what I believe the real role of business leaders is. It's his job to anticipate all the dynamics that affect the employment of all the employees that deserve a job next year. He has to make sure that the people that deserve a job next year have a job next year. That sound right to you? So part of that is to anticipate the stupid moves the federal government's going to make that money with that. Because if government work is germane in your business model, you have to have government work in your business because it's perfectly counter cyclical to the stock market. Everyone understand what I mean by that? Has a seesaw relationship to the stock market. And when the stock market collapses on every president's watch, they got to look like they're doing something. Politics are for lesser minds. All right, the, the last big one that I, I'm going to bring up to you, you already mentioned it, is maintenance. Maintenance. Now, before, before we actually write down maintenance in all capital letters, are there any others that you want to add to the list? Because you're missing a bunch. <laughs> look, look, look. No one gets to be funnier than me. That's a freaking rule, all right? Right? <laughs> so the deal is, is this. All right, there's a couple you're missing. What about hygiene? What about, like, you need, like uh, I don't care how bad the economy is, you still got to wipe your butt, right? So the, anything that P&G sells, anything that, uh, that um, shelter, oh, this is a big one. Anything with the word assisted in it, write that down. Anything with the word assisted in it. Anything with the word senior in the title. Anything with the word used. Anything with the word rental. Storage. You see where I'm going with this? This should start to become obvious at this point, right? But maintenance is a big one, and maintenance for three reasons. The first one is obvious. You keep your old stuff longer, you got to maintain it. Second one, not so obvious. If your company is going to sell somewhere in the next 10 years, by the way, this you got to write down. More companies will change hands in the next 15 years than ever before in American history. More leadership positions will change hands in the next 15 years than ever before in American history. It's a massive opportunity, especially for HR directors. You gotta take ownership of that. What's the future gonna look like? So, and then use the human universals to be able to predict that. But if we're talking about sale, so the equity owners of the company are gonna sell one day, maintenance contracts sell for a premium in deals. So this you wanna write down. Subscription pricing sells for a premium in deals. Is anyone here familiar with due diligence? Anyone? All right, due diligence is really code for I'm not going to pay you what I promised you. It's how do I get you into a room, you sign a document allowing me to look behind the curtain and see what's wrong with the company. And then I'm handing you back a bill for however way you didn't build that company the correct way. The first one is too dependent on the CEO. Remember the first exercise I said, send them on a long vacation with a, with a legal pad. Everything, that, everything on that legal pad is how dependent the company is on them. Because in due diligence, what you're attempting to do is to reassure the acquirer that the revenue stream will continue without you. Whatever's on that list works to the opposite of that. It means you're dependent upon them. 
Second thing is maintenance contracts sell for a premium in deals. Subscription pricing sells for a premium in deals. Why? Because it reassures the acquirer that the revenue stream will continue. Why do you see everything out there is trying to get you a credit card for like a nominal fee each month? Why does Netflix dominate all uh, entertainment now? Everyone's switching to that. Disney Plus, this Plus, that Plus, all those things. They're all going that way because subscription pricing significantly affects valuation. Remember, what's behind what's happening? The third reason why you need to be aware about maintenance is not obvious. I'm presenting in what my wife thought was Palo Alto. And it's kind of a dirty secret to being a public speaker. They tell you you're going to Chicago and you end up in Gary, Indiana. Right. So I'm in the Gary, Indiana, Palo Alto. I'm not. My wife was like, you're going to San Francisco. I'm like, I'm not going to San Francisco. I'm, I'm going to land in San Francisco and then drive like an hour and a half to Sacramento and speak in, in like a like, I don't know, industrial park with no windows. Right. So this is not there's nothing glamorous about what I do. I'm, I'm at the largest concrete manufacturing facility in North America. And I took them at their word because you looked out any window, in any direction. It was a sea of aggregate in every direction. That sound like Palo Alto to you? Didn't sound like Palo Alto to me, right? So the guy who owned it was sitting next to me and he said, he said, Mark, my main takeaway from this presentation is I made a massive mistake in the financial crisis. Oh, it's about to get good, folks. Like, this is, this is the best, especially because the reason why we operate so well in organizations is not because we're brilliant. Biographers lie to us. Stop reading biographies. You want to read historians view of big people in our in our uh, past in our recent past and the reason why is because the biographer has to romanticize the main character the big man involved what it turns out is when you see the historical account it's no that guy didn't have a divine inspiration of an idea and then lit the world on fire no the guy operated in obscurity for 30 years finally had one distinction that was a like a cavalcade of distinctions and then started to do good they're grinders. So what we what we need to do is minimize each other's stupidity by listening to each other's stupidity and then not repeating it. That's what works well for human beings, right? So what happens is this guy said, oh, I made a massive mistake in the financial crisis, sacred moment. I said, what do you got? He goes, well, I acquired a building materials company at the previous top of the market. This was the CEO of that concrete company. And, I, and he said, and then my concrete company fell 65% in revenue and we're unionized. And unions are particularly sympathetic when you drop 65% in revenue, right? That was more of that sarcasm. You guys don't have enough of that here in Springfield. All right, so what happens is he spent all of his time trying to renegotiate the, the contract with the union, and did he get anywhere with that? No. So worse yet, he let life follow the solution. The solution was the building materials company acquired at the previous top of the market. Why? Because you need two ingredients to sell concrete. The first one is demand to build new. How much demand to build new do you get at the bottoms of markets? Not a lot. It's not none. It's not a lot. Remember that laundry list you just wrote down? Those guys are kind of irritated when everything's going good. Everything's going good. They're kind of annoyed because everything's too expensive. Then the market collapses, and then the last people stand, and they're like, well, now I can build new. Now it's a buyer's market. So you'll, you'll have some. So what happens here is, but you need two ingredients to sell concrete. The first one is demand. The second one is the ability to get financing. What's your ability to get financing like at the bottoms of markets? Good, right? That's because the majority of all financiers are publicly traded and publicly traded companies are run really well, right? That was more of that sarcasm. All right, so what happens is they suffer from something called shareholder primacy. In the 80s, Wall Street convinced publicly traded companies that no, the shareholder is more important than the, the customer. And then all strategic thought dropped to 90 days because a publicly traded CEO is over scrutinized every 90 days, like a job interview, a privately held CEO is under scrutinized. I'm looking to, to, to positively move the needle on that. What I do regularly is take CEOs out to the woodshed and slap them around out of love to point their energies, of their company in the right direction. And the reason why is because we're capable together of leaving this world a better place. If you're ever standing over my grave, I want my headstone to read, he helped the few protect the many, right? So can you think of a better audience to be talking to today than that, than you guys? So the argument here is this, I wanted to know what that guy's mistakes were because I wanted to learn from them and have everybody else learn from them. 
The real trick here was he made a massive mistake. And what he was, the mistake he made was he wasn't concentrating on the building materials company. You need two ingredients to sell concrete. First is demand, so you'd have some. The ability to get financing, you have none. So what are those people gonna do? They're not gonna do new construction, they're gonna do rehab work. They're gonna take existing facilities and rehabilitate them or repurpose them into a new purpose. Well, how much concrete do you need in that type of construction? A lot or a little? Like enough to build like one handicapped accessible ramp because it's legally required today. It wasn't back when the structure was first built, but you will need sheetrock, screws, nails, ceiling stuff, lights, uh, normally windows, flooring, doors. You need building material supplies. So this man had the ability to create a counter cyclical revenue stream and let the solution lie fallow. So I want you to write that down. It's the first step in pointing the energies of your company in the right direction. Counter cyclical revenue stream. Counter cyclical revenue stream. And now we are finally at the dirtiest secret of organizations like this. Are you guys familiar with the gym membership model? What do you think this is? You're shaking your head yes. So what do you think the statistics of the gym memberships are? How many people that pay for gyms actually use the gyms? It's 12%. All right, now that's, you know, it's sporadic over the course of the year, but that's the average for a course of a year, 12%. So higher in January, lower in, uh, at, the end, uh, at the end of the year, right? Um, now, what do you think the percentage is? Anyone here use gyms regularly? Okay, cool. So you guys let me know this, because I'm, I'm doing an anecdotal study about this. All right, so, <laughs> So with the, with the, uh, of the 12% that actually use the gym, how many of those do you think are actually using the equipment correctly? What would you say? All right, so, so far, anecdotally, I'm hearing half. So we're down to 6%. And then of the 6% that actually pay, go, and use the equipment correctly, how many of them aren't doing something foolish like steroids or something that's gonna come back to haunt them later in life? Anyone want to take a stab at it? I know it's really hard to get that type of statistic. Anecdotally so far, it's, we're down to 3%. So if I'm joining a gym to get healthy, how many actually do? It's the minority, right? So the reason why I bring it up is because there's lots of opportunities for you in continuing education programs like this to hear wisdom from speakers, but then how many of you have ever heard wisdom from speakers and then did nothing with that wisdom? Am I the only idiot in the room? You see where I'm going with this? So what we want to do is minimize the likelihood of that. So what I want to know is before you walk out of here today, what did you get out of this? What are you going to do differently? But before I let you guys go, I'm going to teach you, if I haven't melted your brain so far, I'm going to melt your brain now. I'm going to teach you what are the dynamics, the trends, and what creates extreme valuation. Now, you might even be sitting back going, Mark, why do I need to know about this? Because that's what think tanks are measured against. So if private equity was going to buy your company, what would they do to create extreme valuation? You want to know what that is because it pads your resume. Remember, certification and mergers integration. What does that mean? you got to understand the motivations of why publicly traded companies acquire privately held companies. Now, before I go there, has anyone here ever heard of the accretive benefit of acquisition. Anyone? The accretive benefit of acquisition. It's on the next page in your handout. What's your name, sir? Brent, why do you know about it? Awesome. So of the 20,000 companies that I've presented to in the last five years, you're the 156th person that's heard about this before I started talking about it. And that's tragic. That's something we need to move the needle on. And it's because of Sorbanes-Oxley. People here are familiar with that term? Anyone not? It's a law that went into practice in 2002 to end the Wolf of Wall Street and the Enrons of the world. The unintended consequence of Sorbanes-Oxley was it eliminated a liquidity means for your business to grow. That's tragic. That's an unintended consequence. I'm gonna rectify that now because the think tank and companies need to be aware of what I'm about to teach you. And frankly, if you don't understand it, you're not alone. 
Only 50% of the people that I teach this to get it on the first try. And I am a phone call away, so please write this down. It is 516-659-0151. 516-659-0151. Yes, that is my cell phone number. But we're going to make an agreement. You're not going to abuse that. You're not going to do what they did in Buffalo and call and send me text messages about how much the New York Jets stink. I already know. We don't need to have that conversation. I met Joe Namath seven years ago, and I was like a five-year-old girl at a Justin Bieber concert. I was like, it's Joe Namath. Like this, right? right? I should have smacked that dude for making me a Jet fan. It's been like 50 arduous years ever since. All right, so let's, let's, let's rectify this. Sorry. Can you hit that two more times over there? One more. There you go. The accretive benefit of acquisition, or what I call the secret stock market. This is a future book, by the way. This will be the next book. As soon as I'm finished writing the book on why we're so politically divided, this will be my follow-up work to that. So this is going to melt your brain. There's three stories I have to tell you about this to get you to the right psychology in order to understand how this dynamic works. The first one is this. Um, has anyone here seen the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, you saw it? Okay, let me, let me correct some historical inaccuracies from that movie. Uh, I met those guys in 1989. The first thing is they were not on Wall Street. They were on Marcus Avenue in Lake Success, Long Island. The second thing is no one looked like Leonardo DiCaprio. They looked like the physical embodiment of pond scum. Like, did you ever leave a meeting and felt like you needed to take a shower? I needed like a Lysol bath and a vitamin shot. They, they were like contagious, the deserving of jail time, and most of them in the room went to jail. I was a newly minted investment banker with Merrill Lynch. I think my official title was sit down and shut up. The only reason why I was at that meeting is because I was still living with my parents in Queens, which is right next to Lake Success. So the, S, the, the senior vice president was going, add his joke company on Long Island. They want to have a meeting with us. I think it's because they want our table scraps. He looked at me, he goes, you live in Queens, right? I was living in Bayside, Queens at the time. He goes, uh, you're going. Cut to, I'm sitting in a room with the Wolf of Wall Street and his crazy crew, and they're trying to convince me that they could take companies public at $10 million in revenue. So let's call that the entry level to go public in 1989. Anyone want to take a guess what it is today? Brent, you want to take a guess? No? It's $600 million in revenue. That's not inflation, folks. That's regulation. That's sorbanes. So picture the first time I started presenting this, this concept, the accretive benefit of acquisition, was in Chicago. Now, I, I learned about this from the uh, certification in mergers and acquisitions. So this is where I learned is the best takeaway from it. If you learn this part, understand it. You don't have to take that, cert that certification. But if you lean towards accounting, it's a good one. I hate accounting. Like, uh, I don't hate accounting. There's not enough syllables in the word hate to describe how much I hate accounting, right? So the, uh, the test was actually quite tough, and I'm a really, really good test taker at this point. So the argument, though, is if you lean towards accounting, that's a good one to pad your resume. If not, then the other way to go is a uh, certification in mergers integration. That's more of an HR certification. I don't have that one, but I hear really good things about it. So here, the accretive benefit of acquisition. First time I'm presenting it, I'm in Chicago, and there's a guy in the corner of the room was the first of the 156, Brent, that heard about it before I started talking about it. And I said, uh, accretive benefit of acquisition, and I can't spell, so I'm not writing that on the wall. I wrote ABA on a whiteboard, and the guy goes, guy in the corner goes, I know what that is. I said, why do you know what that is? He said, well, I was the CFO at Rubbermaid. And in the eight years I was at Rubbermaid, that was the cornerstone of our acquisition philosophy. Uh, and we made 400 acquisitions in those eight years, right? I'm sitting back going, damn, I thought Rubbermaid made stuff out of plastic. You're telling me Rubbermaid can out private equity, private equity? And the answer is hell to the yeah. All right, so this is the reason why. So third story, I speak a lot. I'm, I average 52 cities a year. This will be, uh, when, I, when I fly home tonight, uh, this will be my 14th airplane in 14 days. Right, so I fly a lot, I speak a lot, and the life is not glamorous, like I've talked about before. So picture I'm doing three of these in Atlanta, like one, two, three. You typically you land on a Monday, you speak on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then you're gone. 
right? And uh, if, you, if you fly as much as me, you're either a Hilton guy or a Marriott guy, right? I'm a Hilton guy. So, and everywhere from New York is like 10 hours away, no matter where you're going. Unless it's the West Coast, then it's 12 hours away, right? So it's like you're racing to get to the hotel to see if before the restaurant closes, so you can get a meal in before you have to go to sleep, wake up and do the whole thing again, again the next day. And my, I, I'm married a second time, Tom. Familiar? So picture, my, this, we weren't newlyweds at this point, but we were close. And my wife calls me up. I'm sitting at the bar at the Hilton in Atlanta. And, and she, she calls me up and she goes, uh, where are you? I said, I'm in the bar at the Hilton in Atlanta. And she goes, don't talk to any pretty girls. Now, uh, do you guys travel as much as me? Anything she got to worry about? It's a sea of middle-aged dudes, right? You could take a glass and throw it in any direction, and you're hitting a middle-aged dude in the head, in the forehead, right? So like she's got nothing to worry about. The guy next to me starts laughing when he hears her say over the phone, don't talk to any pretty girls. He starts cracking up. He's like, why don't you film us? She's safe as a kitten, right? So, so we start up a friendly conversation, like kind of single serving friends, you know, like everyone's in the same boat. So the guy goes to me, he goes, how long are you here for? I go, I'm here till Thursday. He goes, oh, I'm here for a year. Whoa, what? You're in a Hilton for a year? I go, why? He goes, oh, I'm taking this company public across the street. Whoa, this is 2018, 16 years since Sorbane's Oxley. How many times? Now, I left Wall Street in 96, so I never took a company public under the auspices of, of Sorbanes. How many times do you think I've ever heard someone say, oh, I'm taking this company public, let alone across the street? This is the one guy. I mean, there's more companies which will go private in the next 15 years and will go public because of Sorbanes. Sorbanes is that prohibitively expensive. So I said to him, whoa, don't point strong. Don't tell me the name of the company. I got lots of questions for you. So the first one is your private equity. He goes, yeah, out of Dallas. And I said, uh, I said, they've outgrown your portfolio. Yes, you're exactly correct. They want to they uh, ring the cash register and a couple of the highly compensated want, want you know, to take some winnings off the table, that kind of thing. I said, uh, they're doing more than 600 million in revenue. He said, yeah, two and a half billion. I said, they got to be some type of software as a service, no infrastructure whatsoever. The majority of all companies that will go public in the next 15 years will be scalable, right? And he said, uh, he said, yep, he's a software as a service company. I said, and they have no idea how difficult it's going to be to be Sorbanes compliant. And the guy said, I just left a four hour meeting with the think tank right before he met me. And they all walked out of the meeting like white as ghosts. How many accountants do you think this company had before, prior to Sorbanes? 12. How many do you think this guy said they needed in order to get to Sorbanes compliance? 150 right i was like damn 150 and then i said something and he interrupted me what i said was how long is it going to take you to build he goes oh the accounting wing yeah it's going to take about uh 18 months i said whoa 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 that's not an accounting wing that's an accounting company you're going to build an accounting company at the previous top of the market that's how difficult it is to be sorbane's compliance folks so you're never going public what you can hope for is to sell to a publicly traded company. And I'm going to teach you in the next five minutes how to win that transaction. Sound good so far? Now, would that pad your resume? Hell yeah. So what that is, is it comes down to this. There is a arbitrage. So this you want to write down. Sorbane's compliance, 150 accountants. That's a moat, folks. And what do moats do? Moats create arbitrage. Don't ask me how to spell it. Just write it down. I think it starts with an A. And it's French for riskless profit. Riskless profit arbitrage. So an arbitrage is created by a publicly traded company acquiring a private company. So what is arbitrage? It's when you're valuing something on one marketplace and it's valued differently on another marketplace. The difference between those two numbers is riskless profit because you buy it on that marketplace and automatically it moves to the other marketplace. So publicly traded. So dude, what's, what's, your, uh, what, what's, what's your name? Yeah, okay. Trista? All right, so Trista, let's say you own a hundred million uh, in revenue company. And Trista uh, trades for a one times revenue multiplier just to keep the math simple. Now I'm doing 15 billion in rev. I'm a publicly traded company. I've got $100 million sitting on my balance sheet. Why should I buy her company with it? 
What if I just leave the $100 million on my balance sheet? What's the valuation of $100 million? It's $100 million. It's a one times valuation multiplier. Now, she trades for $100 million. Do I get a valuation bump if I use my $100 million to acquire her company? The answer is hell yeah. So picture, we're going to do, a, you know, you got to stay with me. There's lots of lessons in this. We're not going to do a back-end covenant deal. No earnouts to this deal. I'm going to give you $100 million for you to go away. Sound good? All right, so now you're going to go pay your taxes and go to Hawaii or something like that? Sound good? Okay, but you're going someplace else. So I accrete. What accretion is for the purposes of this conversation is I'm, absor I'm absorbing her $100 million into my $15 billion company. Now what's her $100 million company valued at? Is it still $100 million? No, it's my valuation. And what does my valuation translate into in this world? A minimum two to five times. So what does that mean? That means I just manufactured at a thin air up to $400 million by acquiring her company. Now, if that didn't melt your brain, you didn't understand it. And what that actually means is there is a fiduciary responsibility on the part of publicly traded companies to acquire. So your mission at the think tank of your company is to figure out what creates extreme valuation and then perpetrate that into your business model earlier than the transaction. You know how to do that and your resume is thick. You are incredibly valuable because like I said before, of the 20,000 companies that I've taught this to, how many of them knew about it before I started talking about it? You're looking at 156. That's a travesty. I want to move the needle on that. So what does that mean? You don't have to remember everything I said to here today. What you got to do, though, is keep my number close to you. You're welcome to tear out that last page of your handout. Say, Mark, I want to talk to you about this, that, or the other thing. I do not charge for that. I consider it a personal favor to your organization. So Bruce will owe me a favor. Right? So the deal here is, is that what we want to do is make sure privately held companies are pointing the energies of their company in the right direction. What helps you to do that is to know if your vision at your company is scrutinized properly. What will investors look like, look at your company in the future? Did you build it the right way? You got to be asking really annoying, difficult questions in the think tanks to make sure the energies are pointed in the right direction. So, and the reason why is because through commerce, we are capable of what religion hopes to accomplish and what politicians fail at. So now I'd like to open it up to questions. Any questions? All right. So if there's no questions, then what we're going to do is volunteer or voluntold. I want you to look back through your notes. So this way you're not listening to wisdom from speakers and doing nothing with it. I want to know what did you get out of this? And then you tell me a little bit about your business and maybe I can give you a little coaching. Okay. So look back, take a look. Tell me what did you hear and what are you going to do differently? Not listen to the news. Good call. So we're going to go around. Mike, what did you get? Be strategic with his relationship. Awesome. What would you fellas get? I'm going to come back to you. What would you get? Say again. Don't pay attention to politics. Did you get anything out of it? Oh, that's cool. Tell him I said hello. You can actually uh, communicate to him. Uh, that guy's brilliant. Having, listening to him have a conversation. He said, I'm going to follow Michael Shermer's podcast. Listening to him have a conversation with another PhD, the reason why that's so valuable to you is PhDs cannot even lie to you accidentally. Right? If they do, they can be defenestrated. So the only downside with dealing with them is they tend to be overcomplicated. They suffer from like ready, aim, 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 fire. But the rest of us are ready, fire, aim. So spending time with them kind of morphs us towards the center so we'll make better decisions. The other benefit of listening to PhDs is because not a one of them can build a cohesive argument on their own. 
then if they want to communicate any of those arguments to us, they have to cite all these other PhDs, which creates this awesome spider web of objective truth. So turn off the news. What else do you get? Anyone? What'd you got? Oh, awesome. It's a bibliography. So it's lots of reading material. Although I didn't see a hand raised when we were talking about good books. So what I'd say is start with the podcast too. Michael Shermer or Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan does some really good podcasts because he has he has more uh, viewership than Fox News and CNN combined. That's the reason why I both don't like him, right? So what ends up happening is he attracts some of the brightest minds that have ever lived. Steven Pinker is probably the smartest man alive today and incredibly humble. Great place to start. Cool. What'd you guys, did you guys get anything out of it, Ben? What'd you get? Say again? Like uh, to, to hate Disney? Gotcha. What'd you get? Yeah, I, I took a nonprofit that searched our web for something in the government. Mm -hmm. So my responsibility is to make sure that the system works and the system that the government will do and try to minimize the burden. Awesome. Uh, do, uh, do you deal with donations at all? Okay, so if you are if you are on a like drive to increase donations, one of the ways to do it is that that exercise we ran where we were looking for what are recession resistant business models. Their checks more likely to cash in the next downturn. That's the concept. Cool. And if you need any help with demographics, you'll let me know. Cool. Sounds good. What'd you guys get? Any? More research, research, actual research as opposed to not. How about yourself? Knowing the age of the end user, absolutely. Arc GIS will be, help you in that in that situation, ladies. All right, so I'm glad you brought this up. So this is one of the best exercises I've ever seen anyone do with that exercise. So picture, um, uh, I was presenting in Toronto. A company out of uh, Hamilton, Ontario, saw me speak, and then called me up and said, "Mark, we want to fly you to Hamburger University in Chicago." You guys know what I'm talking about? Oak Field, Oak, Brewer, Oak Bridge, something like that, right? So it used to be owned by McDonald's, big conference center. And they, they said, we want to spend all day with you. I'm like, you do? I'm like, my wife doesn't even want to spend all day with me. Why would you want to spend all day with me? They said, well, what we want is we want that exercise. Remember the, uh, uh, the, uh, all, the, all the businesses that benefit from the aging of the population and classically recession resistant? They said, we want every answer you've ever heard. I'm like, damn. I said, why would you want that? I said, you know, because that's overkill in a presentation. And they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to divide our company up into three teams. And then we're going to put the head of uh, business development in charge of each of the divisions. Then after hearing you speak, each division is going to go off into the conference area for two hours, develop a battle strategy, how they're going to develop relationships with everyone on the list because they split the list into thirds. One took a third, one took a third, one took a third. The end of the two hours, each of the divisions was going to come back and present their battle strategies to myself, the CEO, and the COO. Now, do you think I'm going to be talking to any anybody in that company about suicide anytime soon? Do I got to worry about that company anymore? No, frankly, they're kicking so much butt, their feet hurt. So that's taking ownership of this. Remember, you don't want to go tell people what they should be doing. You want to elicit it with Socratic questions. You want to ask the right questions to get them. Because if you look back on your list, if you turn back to that page six, you look back on the list that you created versus the ones we added to. Remember how I asked you to sequester them? Those answers that you came up with, none of them look stupid to you. They look brilliant. Why? Because they're your ideas. That's how it works, right? So if it's their idea, they're more likely to invest their energies behind it. And remember, the sales force is the rudder and the propulsion of the company. Don't surrender uh, strategy to sales force. What'd you guys get out of it? Awesome. Without a doubt. Well, it's almost like picture what I want you to be doing with your strategic planning is a day of this and then do the strategic planning like I just talked about with that company. Good call. Good job. Did you get anything out of this? Yep. Steady at the helm. Forget politics. It's a waste of time. Ladies, did you get anything out of this? Yeah. Very cool stuff. There's actually a great book on the sub subject, too, called Unoffendable. Good stuff. You read it? Was it good? Yeah. I, maybe, maybe you just need to read the title. 
Yeah, and, and frankly, it's in our striving to always be right, we're rarely right, right? It's kind of a, a, a oxymoron. So, fellas, did you get anything out of this? Dude, that's killer right there. Counter cyclical revenue stream. I'm telling you, you're sitting in due diligence five years from now. You hit them with count like uh, uh, across the table from some sharp teeth sharks. You hit them with counter cyclical revenue stream. You'll be teaching them something. Fellas, what do you got? Anything out of this? <laughs> this is awesome. Remember, nobody gets to be funnier than me. All right, that's a rule. Fellas, you got anything? Sure, if you have any issues with that, you got my cell phone number, send me a quick uh, quick text message. Ladies, did you get anything out of this? Yeah, sounds cool, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So picture a book on that down the road. If you'd like to, uh, on that last page, if you want to say, hey, I want to get on the list so I can get that book when it comes out, you can just give me contact and I'll make sure it happens. Cool? Fellas. Yep, awesome. So trucking, manpower, pallet, and packaging. Good call, guys. Ladies, anything? Yeah. So if you need any help taking them out to the woodshed, you give me a call. Because what happens is like uh, I can teach it to them how it, it will grow their, uh, their net worth exponentially. So this this is there's some software that I employ in my in my presentations when we do workshops with companies. The average we have a uh, almost, just under a thousand case studies so far. The average wrong with a privately held company is one third the value. A as it stands right now, the private middle markets it's ten million dollars more the companies could be worth if they concentrate on what's wrong with the companies. And the reason why that's so important is because what we stink at we ignore. And what we ignore becomes a flashpoint of catastrophe in the next downturn. So I'm looking to minimize work, the referrals that we give to turnaround specialists. Did you get anything out of this? Nice. Good call. The, the, the main knock on privately held CEOs is they're too tactical. They're like there's such solid tacticians that qualify to sit in the chair they sit in. But what is what, what human nature is, what is our strength becomes our weakness. And if you're too tactical, your nose is too close to the grindstone. We need to rip the nose off the grindstone so we can look over the horizon more accurately. So you look like uh, I'm running out of time here, am I? Cool, cool. Well, uh, what, did you get anything? Awesome. That sounds like HR uh, vernacular, but I like what you said. Sounded good. What do you got? Oh, cool. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's talk. All right, ladies, did you get anything out of this? I have a question. Sure, cool, by the way. So if you were talking to a younger group of people that were going out to college, yes. where would you ask them? You know, this, this comes up every once in a while. I ran into a woman. OK, um, if, you were, if you were communicating with a younger um, uh, generation, high school group or college. Yeah. Does everyone hear that? Okay, so he wants to say it again. My question is, where do I tell my kids to go? Like, what do they study to be successful moving forward, right? Because the future of work is changing, um, industry is changing, all this is changing. So where's the best place for them to study? Not where, but what? Okay, so I get this every once in a while. It's always from a good mom, by the way. So, so the deal is, is the, uh, like I had one woman, she had three kids at, that earned Division I scholarships for football. She said, what majors should they, should they uh, be looking at? You break down this page six, the second half of page six, that's what they should be looking at. If they're slightly older, what I recommend that they send their resume out in their junior year of college. And there's a thing about middle-aged dudes. We love to espouse all the wisdom we've accumulated over the years, right? So what you do is you write a letter to middle-aged, because most of the CEOs, especially in the private middle markets, are middle-aged dudes, right? So they send a letter saying, tell me, oh, why Sage One? I'm a junior at this school uh, looking to graduate. If, if knowing all that you've learned over your career, if you were to do it over again, what would you major in? What would you be doing with your energies in uh, scholastics? Guarantee, you, you send it out to 100 of them. They all think it was, it was only sent to them. 
they'll, they'll, like, they'll be begging for the resume by the time the person graduates high school. So it's similar to that overall. The key here is human universals. There are 63 human universals. I'm not going to list them all out here. All you have to do is Google 63 human universals. It'll pop up right there. What they have to recognize is human beings evolve glacially slow. We are so boring, all you have to do is answer the challenges of normal people. That's the key to marketing, by the way. You don't want to think like, a, like an HR director. You want to think like a normal person, but then act like an HR director. You get what I'm saying? So that's the art in all of this. So food for thought. Hopefully that answers your question. If you need any more, you send me a, send me a note, right? Did you get anything? There you go. Politics, lesser minds. Fellas? Awesome. Guys, anything? Yes, this is key. Victim mentality is everywhere. And this is one of the things. Now, this is going to get a little funky here, but it's worthwhile for you to understand it. If something happens in interpersonal relationships or interpersonal communication, it's pernicious and persistent. It means there was some type of evolutionary benefit to it. Like picture, why are your, your children afraid of the dark? Well, in our ancestral past, bad things happened in the dark. So if a kid was born not afraid of the dark, that kid got eaten and didn't live long enough to procreate. So why are children afraid of dark? Why are children afraid of monsters in their closets? It's because whatever enabled our ancestors to survive long enough to procreate continues in the next generation. So they're not afraid of monsters, they're afraid of predators. So why is victim mentality so persistent? is because it benefited our ancestors to live long enough to procreate. It's the epitome of immaturity. Can you lead from victim? Yes or no? No, because it means you're not an adult. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's going to jail or someone who's dying. You know what I mean? Like, you got cancer, it'll cut you a little slack, a little slack. You know, but if you're, if you're shy of those two extremes, like no one's dying, no one's going to jail, you're not a victim. You are a willing participant in helping you create that. The reason why that's so powerful, it's called, I write this down, the Cartman Drama Triangle. Cartman is spelt with a K. You're familiar? Bro, you familiar? Yeah, okay, all right. All right, so what that is, that's from transactional psychology. It was invented in 1962. It's very difficult for certain people to hear it, though. People are not always open to this. This can get very, very... Um, rough about people who are permanently victims. The dilemma is simply this. You draw an upside down triangle. You put in the corners of the triangle, you put villain, in the bottom you put victim, and in the, uh, the opposite corner you put rescuer, or the word hero. This is what you're gonna hear from every politician. And the reason why this exists right now is because there is no true villain in the, in the world. I mean, Putin's giving us a run for our money right now, but is, what, how does Putin stack up to Stalin? Stalin was a 60 million mass murdering maniac with an arsenal of nuclear weapons. Anything we got, like, any, we got anything like that right now? So that's a strong enough villain to, to galvanize both sides of the aisle. So the, pol the political drama triangle, which is in my next book, I simply took this concept for interpersonal relationships and applied it to politics, is the, the, the politician, let's, let's use Trump. Of those three roles, villain, victim, or hero, who is Trump in his story? He's the hero, right? Who's the villain? Hillary, Democrats, New York Times, something like that. Now flip it around. You're the New York Times. Who's the New York Times in their version of that story? They're the hero, right? Or Hillary was the hero when, when she was running against Trump, right? Who's the victim in all of that? Us. Voter, it's code for voter. Now, they'll never call, out, call you a victim, but when you believe in heroes, you're playing the victim. See, the real dilemma here is this. Anyone steps into my world claiming to be my hero, I know they're the villain. And I spy them really suspiciously. Now, it, like, so picture, you should be so skeptical after hearing me speak, you're even skeptical of me, right? Is that resonating with anybody here? All right, so you need to know what my agenda is. My agenda is this. I make people rich. I make people so wealthy, they end up having an estate tax issue challenge that's so large, I got to find them a charity that they like better than the federal government. So far, we've had a 100% track record with that, by the way. 
So but what the enemy of your mission and your message is to play that very much that victim. How does that relate to evolutionary theory? Is because playing the victim enabled our ancestors to live long enough to procreate. It kept them safe in the center. I'm the victim, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. The catch, however, is it means you're a child. You can never play victim ever again to anything. It's a really great question to be asking ourselves is, where am I playing the victim now? So what I got to do is recognize I'm responsible for every decision I have ever made. And the beauty of that is what that does is if you're playing the victim, you're giving away all the power to fix whatever you're up against to the challenge. As soon as you say, I'm 100% responsible for it, especially difficult in a divorce too, Tom, right? So what happens is as soon as I recognize that was 100%, like you saw all the red flags, I saw all the red flags, right? You can't sit back there and tell me you didn't. You did, you ignored them, hoping everything's gonna work out, right? That's the way, that's the way uh, uh, interpersonal relationships start out. And the real dilemma here is with an interpersonal relationship, if you step into a relationship with a perma victim, you come in as the rescuer, throw all sorts of energy, eliminating the villain. Well, a victim can't be a victim without a villain. So what the victim will do is turn you, the rescuer, into the villain, and then you ultimately become the victim confirming victimhood actually exists. It's a colossal waste of time, yet it's something that we all kind of need to learn over a certain time period, and politics doesn't make that happen. The press doesn't make that happen. So we need to break that cycle and recognize I'm not a victim. Fair? So good call. I know that was a long-winded answer to, uh, to a, a good thing that you brought up. So did you get anything out of this? Oh, yeah? <laughs> okay, cool. Did you get anything out of this? Awesome. Terrific. See, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this type of stuff up for you guys, because you guys are like the complaint department. Who here enjoys being the complaint department? Wait, nobody? Right? There's another thing, too, here. Is, uh, I'll give you some more. If we do have a little bit more time, all right, so this is something that my, my C-levels take away from my presentations. Um, there are no problems. I'd write that down. There are no problems because we live in the United States. It's a bold statement. So if you, you make a bold statement, you got to back it up. In the United States, we have challenges. See, if we're born in Somalia, do we got problems? Hell yeah. Right? You got cancer. Again, I'll cut you a little slack. Shy of those two extremes, we live in a world of challenges. Now, that's not just semantics. Because picture, if a direct report comes into my office saying, Mark, we got a problem with this client, I already know they're in the wrong mental headspace to solve it. So challenge, when you're in challenge mentality, you're 85% of the way to the solution. So if we were to role play this, so let's say you came into my office, you said, Mark, we got a problem with this client, and he's sitting down. Do you mind standing up? All right, so if he comes in standing up, I'm standing up. The reason why is because communication happens between equals. If he's sitting down, I'm sitting down. And I'm going to sit back and recognize, what's your first name? Matt. Okay, so I already know Matt's. If he's using the word problem, he's in the wrong mental headspace. So what I'll turn to him and say, wow, that sounds like a tough issue. What can be done about it? Never use the word problem ever again except to teach this lesson. Unless the word no is front of, in front of the word problem. All right, so you, you say to me, you, you start yapping and yapping and yapping. I'm looking like I'm actually listening, right? Now, I'm not taking stock of any of this stuff, you know? So I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening, hearing the issue, hearing the issue, hearing the issue. And then finally, I turn to him and say, wow, that sounds like a tough challenge. What can be done about it? And then shut up. Best book on the subject, Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. That's not on my bibliography. Um, so what happens here is I'm going to sit back and I'm going to listen to him, say, just please, please stay standing. I'm going to turn to him and say, uh, what can be done about it? Now I'm listening. Now I don't know if you guys, can you guys in Missouri, can you, pre, can you perform uh, um, IQ tests on new hires? No, you can't? Well, in New York, you can't either. So this is actually an IQ test. So whatever comes out of Matt's mouth is going to fall on the spectrum of stupid to brilliant, right? Now, if he's consistently on the stupid side, I should be making him available to the employment market. 
if he's consistently on the brilliant side, he's open to coaching. That's cool. All right, so now he's coachable. So now what I say is whatever comes out of his mouth, I go, wow, that's brilliant, dude. Like, like last month when you had that other idea, that was brilliant, especially if it was. You don't want to lie to the person, right? But then you're going to do this. You're going to say, when's that going to be done by? And you sit in silence. And then pull out your phone and do your old man, I don't know how to work technology routine, right? And you start, you start slowly, agonizingly slow, as you're watching the body language on the person, you pull out your calendar and go, okay, well, you said it's going to be done by March 5th? And the guy goes, yeah. And I said, is that your best? Sit in silence until the person answers. So like, no, 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 I can do it March 2nd. Okay, March 2nd it is. I'm going to put this in. Is that close of business March 2nd, 5 o'clock? And you put it in your calendar agonizingly slow. And say, okay, I'm going to uh, call you on March 2nd at 5. That's a good job, man. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. And then you call them. You do that five times, they will never come into your office ever again. You're welcome. So now I've given you a lot of information in a very short period of time. It's a little like drinking from a fire hose is what I hear about, like the, the criticisms in my presentation. Uh, but I don't know if I'm ever going to get to see you guys again. So I want to give you everything I got in as short a time period as possible. Don't get overwhelmed. You need anything. You got my cell phone number. Send me a text message. Mark, oh, you know, what about this? What about that? If you, want, if you got a specific conversation you need to have with me, remember, I don't charge for those. You're welcome to give me one of those forms before I walk out of the door. But you did something for me here today. This is higher purpose work for me. I'm on this planet to help leaders of leaders. Remember, you help the few, protect the many. And remember, it's because through commerce, we are capable of what religion hopes to accomplish and politicians fail at. But that requires time and it requires attention. And my sense is, I know you gave me your time, but my sense is you gave me your attention too. Just want to thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, guys.